this year. Um, we had to do an emergency procurement of a uh, portable um, thing we could take out in a small boat because some boats just can't come into the town pier because of their draft or whatever other reason. So we have to be able to pump them out. Um, that was very inefficient because you could do one boat and then you had to go and um, take it off, empty it, everything else. It's not something that's a permanent replacement. So we started looking at the scheduled hours that they're out there, how much um, product they're pumping every year. And we figured out that, um, that we could probably run two boats and keep it busy um, doing pump outs. And the, the benefit of that is when we have a patrol boat out there, well, it's a patrol, it's a pump out boat, they're actually going to boats and offering to do pump outs and making themselves visible. I mean, they, they know who's out there, they know how long they've been out there and they know whether they've pumped them out or not. And so they, they see a boat that's been out there for several days, they make themselves known and say, hey, you know, we're available to do this, doesn't cost anything, blah, blah, blah. Um, and with over 2000 boats in that harbor, we think, um, that this will significantly enhance the um, water quality um, degradation that's caused by uh, gray water being pumped into the harbor and possibly mm -hmm. black water too. Um, our other capital item is uh, 500,000 to finish up uh, the Loran housing renovations and enhancements out there in Sconset. Uh, if you know, this year we got, I think 495,000 that were in the process of um, just getting ready to put the bids out where they're going to reside, fix the roof, put new windows, do things uh, like that to the exterior of the facility. Um, this 500,000 will, um, the primary amount of the funding uh, will be for connection to the town sewer. Right now we're on a um, septic um, okay. system and a septic system with 36 um, beds is high maintenance. Um, town sewer is a uh, just right down the road and so uh, this money should fund be able to fund that as well as the in, inside um, ch uh, changes whatever need to be made um, I suppose plumbing and bathroom and stuff Nine fifty. Oh. okay nine hundred fifty thousand huh. see if I ask for less I get more <laughs> They'll count on it. <laughs> it's not a trend, Chief. Okay. <laughs> well, don't feel bad. It was 50000 on my note. To begin with, yeah, so on ours here. as well. Yeah. So, uh, the, our budget this year is, other than those changes, uh, the biggest uh, single factor was the personnel increase that went up. It's because of this year we're added um, a parking coordinator um out of this year's extra funding uh, for the parking position so i think our increase is like 200 and some thousand dollars overall in salary costs um uh, this year so going into next year and a big part of that was those new positions um, that were added for the parking and the rest of it is just contractual increases um salaries uh, uh step raises things like that um we have uh, we basically have just increased uh, a few things that we traditionally were um, moving some funds around to cover um, small amounts twenty five hundred dollars five hundred dollars here twenty five hundred there uh, if you go down the list on page seventeen you can see our um, specific breakdown uh, salary went up ninety thousand our longevity pay one up people have been here longer um, our general data processing we raised that 2500 that's been probably the single probably the single most out of control it's almost like healthcare the way that data processing costs are just all over the board and going up and then we've really got hit this year with a lot of extra uh, um, fees for uh, there's been a significant increase in in attacks on networks um, for law enforcement and mm -hmm. stuff this year our uh, security fees that we pay for our contractors it just seems like it's just going up and up and up um, uniforms <clears throat> last year if you remember if you remember in fiscal year 18 I had a I think it was 10 people um, 
either retired or left. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> fiscal year 19, we spent a good percent of the time trying to fill all the positions, get them trained. Had our usual trouble getting people into the academies. Um, in uh, the latter part of 19, the Cape Cod uh, police chiefs and with along with us started our own academy and uh, over at um, Otis Air Force Base. And we were able to get all the positions filled except one. Um, I actually had three people over this whole course of the last year work that we had hired and uh, two of them didn't make it through the academy and one left the day before the academy. So we still have one vacant position, but that's it. The bad news of that is uh, every year we have unfunded position or we have funded positions that are vacant. So we're able to move money around this year. We've had year almost the whole year with somebody in every position. So our, our funding for FY 20 is going to be very, very tight um, to be able to make the end of the year. Um, so these increases that you see for uniforms, uh, ammunition, things like that, those are the costs that we incurred extra for the price of the training mm -hmm. um, going off. When an officer goes to training, they have to send a thousand rounds of ammunition with them. That's not cheap. Um, and when we send 10 people, it's not, you know, that's a lot of people. Um, uh, it costs us right about $50,000 per officer for the, before we can use them for patrol. Mm -hmm. um, when we hire and train somebody between their salary, the cost of their training, the cost of their equipment, everything else so um good news is in fy 20 i haven't lost a single officer um so good. you know hopefully this in fy 21 we're not going to be spending a whole lot of money in um, academy fees um, did, yeah did they sign a contract when they come to work for they do they sign a three-year agreement um that if they break that contract or leave before the end of the three years they'll pay back i think it's like twelve thousand dollar uh um, contract breach fee it's prorated over the years so if they stay two years leave one there's a reduction um, but we found that it hasn't been in a lot of cases it hasn't been that big of a deterrence um, to go the officers are able to make so much money um, even in other towns doing details and things like that it's you know they'll pay it and we've even had some towns that have figured out it's cheaper to pay us off than it is to send somebody to an academy for fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Um, yeah. So we looked at raising that, and it it has to be based on your um, costs other than salary and everything. So twelve thousand is right about where we can put a hard number on you know our cost of ammunition, our cost of housing, our cost of things that are other than salary for a new a new officer. Um, and when they go, when I say salary, they all make, um, I think it's, it's 2150 or something like that. No, no, it's $30 an hour, um, as a reserve officer while they're in the academy. So, you know, and that's, that's a fee we're spending for pay that, you know, for 26 weeks at the academy that we don't get back. Um, the, everything else just minor. We just added $2,500 to our um, police vehicle, um, equipment you know that's as they as they modernize the cars some of the stuff we have can't transfer over and we'll have to get like they change the shape of the grill the old bumpers um shields don't work anymore you have to get new ones so just costs a little more but we've been managed to keep pretty good control over that over the years so that's about it good thank you questions for the chief peter good morning chief um we all know what would happen if we didn't have the Loran housing, right, we'd obviously lose 36 beds, and that would affect our operations and, and, and everything else. But how, on a positive standpoint, would it help you <coughs> if we added beds, not to Loran, but added beds around Island, one, and who would actually go into those beds? Would it be upper level, min um, police officers, or entry level? Uh, no, the uh, it. We use the Loran housing out there. I mean, it really is a dormitory, true dormitory, 1960s style, you know, stuff. It wouldn't even qualify. You couldn't even build it anymore that way. Um, so that's just suitable only for summer seasonal workers. Um, it's really not suitable for year-round uh, occupation. Um, even with the renovations, there's only a few rooms in the building that 
can be heated and that's the bathrooms and then there's a, a two room suite at the beginning that was kind of the house supervisor's um, space during the summer we assigned an officer generally lives out there to keep an eye on things in that two room suite um, and then uh, yeah, if we had more housing um, it, you know the, the police officers can find housing it's the it's they can't afford the housing that's out there the rent that you know when there's thirty five hundred dollars for a, a month for rent uh, that's the challenge so um, it's the question is is it better to address that or is it better to address you know the the difficulty in finding it so so if we if we the town owned housing and charge rent to the employees would that be a a burden or would that be helpful for your department operationally if if the town owned housing and charged rent for it I, I i i think if it was reasonable rent i think it would be helpful in keeping people around uh, to some extent um, you still have to get to the uh, across the hump of eventually does somebody want to own a house versus rent a house and as you know when i get them they're 21 years old and renting is great until they're 27 28 29 get married have a kid yep. now they're looking at you know the three bedroom cape cod with a fence around it um mm -hmm. that they're not going to find here yeah. and uh that's why they start looking around I, you know that's kind of a last few years <laughs> phenomena for us we started seeing 10 year guys going to dennis and yarmouth and places like that and that was a reason it's because of the housing but that's something we could never fix um here so I don't know, we just have to figure out what model we want. If I could ask a question about parking, mm -hmm. you, know, you mentioned everything in the, in the report about phase one. Yep. Uh, before you got to phase one, I know the directive came from the select board on parking. Did you avail multiple phase ones to the select board or just one? Did you I give different options? ideas? Did you yeah, we gave options? them different options. Um, you know, uh, we, we laid out a plan for them that, you know, was consistent with what their directives were. Their directives were essentially implement a paid parking um, strategy. And we looked at different options that were out there, um, how it could be implemented. Um, you know, there's so many different ways you can do it. And some of them are complicated and some of them are not so complicated. I mean, I like to say everything from the single space parking meter, that's the simplest, to probably the app um, operated parking system. That may be the least um, costly to the town in terms of infrastructure, but it's probably the most complicated in terms of complexity for the motorists. So which we, we got to look at the different options that were out there and we gave them some different options and they, in a hearing, um, kind of redirected us towards um, deferring the paid part of it and looking at can we do anything to aid number one and the biggest problem we got is lack of data um, okay. and so we're looking at what can we do to fix that part of it mm -hmm. I can collect data I'm not sure what to do with that data so we got to find somebody who can tell us what data we need to answer the questions the select board has you know uh -huh. um, and that's what we're working on now that's part of phase one um, so that's why um, part of our acquisition this year is to get some handheld um, license plate readers to be able to do enforcement with it's certainly not going to make enforcement faster the handheld things actually slow things down but you get data Right now, the chalk and paper is the fastest you can do it, but you get no data. So, um, you know, it's going to be a switch. It's going to be a, a, a trade-off. Um, and, you know, I, I think it'll work. Um, do it. We're going to look at modifications. We're suggesting some modifications to the regulations that would allow us to, um, you know, one of the programs we have is this residential parking district mm -hmm. that is. Basically, if you live on the north side of town, up on Dover Street, or south side, up on Dover Street, wherever it is, uh, you can uh, buy a residential parking permit and it'll allow you to park down on um, Beach Street, you know, because it's in the residential parking district. Well, there's a better, more efficient way of doing that is to do it by neighborhoods, the permits. Mm -hmm. And the, so the parking management software 
that we're seeking, uh, we went out for an RFP on, has an e-permitting function that does a couple of things. One is once the person or a motorist is qualified and they're entered into the system, they can uh, they can just do their own permit purchasing and you know get online, order it. It's there's no there's no stickers anymore. It just automatically goes into a database that they've paid for their permit. And then the handheld license plate readers, when the officers are doing enforcement, it'll tell them, oh, that person's got a permit, and, they won't, and it won't ticket them. So there's a benefit there, and it can be restricted. You can do it, geofence it, to certain neighborhoods. Like maybe if you live on Dover <coughs> Street, that permit's good for three blocks each direction of your mm -hmm. home. And we think by managing that type of distribution, it will better manage the parking inventory that's, that's out there. Um, so that'll be a big help. So that's one part of it. Another part of it is the extended hours. Um, you know, we all know what happens at five o'clock every night downtown because enforcement's until seven. Um, but they, everybody knows the CSOs are, you know, they're not down there till seven o'clock. And uh, so after five o'clock, the town empties out from the daytime workers and all the evening workers and everything bring their cars down there to park. That's a two part problem. One is the, the um, uh, employees are taking up spaces for the customers. And two, we said, why are they doing that? It's because they don't necessarily feel that safe walking six blocks to get to wherever they would have to park their car. Well, that's, that's something that if we can identify that, we can, we can fix that. We can work on that as a police department. And so hopefully this data and moving these time these enforcement times out further will help we know we have to address that safety issue at the same time so it's a very complex project so to speak the mm -hmm. paid part is probably the easiest part yeah. but yet the most um, challenging to an efficient management program because of the public's direct impact mm -hmm. on that so i'm glad they put that off for uh, paid parking for, would help? i paid parking in my opinion it, it it has to, I, I think it'd be too big of a, it, right now it's too big of a unknown and it'll cause too much confusion for us to really, until we can effectively gather the other data we need and everything else. Um, you know, it does give you a revenue source for enhancements to the transportation system like sidewalks, buses, things like that. Things you need to do if you're gonna, you know, make the parking inventory more scarce. But at the same time, I think there may be other options that might be more suitable to what people think for Nantucket. But that's just me thinking. I, you know, the parking uh, gurus, they all say, you know, there's a, you can set a rate and the higher the, the more desirable the space, the higher the rate. And you can do all kinds of things with the rates to discourage the parking. But, you know, somebody's got to figure that out. And mm -hmm. I don't see that person sitting in Nantucket today. Um, so that's what we got to get to uh, before we can implement that part of it, I think. Has the valet parking that the town has, you know, has on during the season, has that been a judge not that effective or worked okay or didn't generate enough revenue or I don't know? Well, it, it obviously generated revenue because they were putting, they were, people were willing to do it. And, um, uh, paid employees to be there so you know it's, it's kind of a mixed sword there too the problem this year when it was when we had a, a lot that was unique for that purpose it worked very well this year we had the complication of um, we took some public spaces and designated it to the valet and it was at the cost uh, to, at the expense of people who work downtown um, and they lost their spaces they've been parking in in many cases for a number of years um, and as they saw it they just lost their space to somebody who's willing or able to pay for that so there was some some friction there between the residents and the visitors and the people using it it's it was hard to pull in downtown at 10 o'clock in the morning and look for a parking place can't find one but you see 30 empty spaces at the end of the town lot that that just rubbed people wrong. So I think if we had a uniquely available space, like we had with the uh, water, the um, electric company property, 
I think it works fine. It works great. It took a lot of cars off the street. Um, but absent that, I think it's something we have to look at. Maybe a different model of doing it. Maybe there's a different way it can be done. Uh, that may, maybe it's efficient for the motorist, but not so efficient for the valet parking company. They may have to go a little further to park the cars, that kind of thing. Okay, um, any other budget questions for the chief? Because otherwise we will move on to the next chief. Uh -huh. So, Chief Pittman, thank you for your time and thank you for the, the excellent explanation. Chief Murphy, you're up. Please. Good morning, Chief Murphy. Good morning. Thank you for being here. It's not too long of a commute from your fire station now. So. No, it's a nice little walk over. It's nice. <laughs> Get to hang my coat up and mop And it for up. everyone else who's come in, um, there's plenty of pastries and coffee in the back. We don't, we want to make sure everybody's happy. So help yourselves. Okay. So what we'd like you to do, if you just, yep. it's kind of the same procedure as last year. Just give us a quick over, you know, an overview of, of what's happening with your department and your numbers, and then we'll ask you questions. Awesome. Yep. Thank you. So my budget is, it's pretty much um, almost a little bit of what you just heard from Chief Pittman, in some respect. Uh, different EIRs, of course. Uh, the payroll budget staying the same, no new positions uh, operating the same for the most part. The EIRs I have this year, uh, continuation of two programs. One is the three-year program replacing our air packs, breathing apparatus that they use uh, for firefighting activities and hazardous activities. That's about a little more than $100,000. And the second is purchasing equipment for the ALS program. That's $100,000 this year. That's equipping two ambulances. Um, after this year, there's $50,000 that'll equip one ambulance. Um, that's one of the exciting things that we have. We actually, out of the program from last year, we have um, now two firefighters that are kind of homegrown uh, paramedics. They've received their National Registry paramedic from the program that we sponsored. We <coughs> funded through a grant through the hospital, so that was uh, last year, so that's awesome. We have another person ready to test. We have another person just about ready to go do their ride time and another one finishing up their clinicals. So we're in a really good place with our ALS program going forward um, with that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The other EIRs we have is ASHRA equipment for our firefighters, which is active shooter emergency response. That's ballistic helmets and vests, as in the time that we are. That's uh, needed protective equipment for the personnel to make sure they're safe. That's $30,000, and then a trailer for 15 that in association, my plans are with the Firemen's Association for funding to equip a trailer um, with supplies we have and some additional equipment for large scale events um, for EMS responses. We can use this at events. It could kind of be like a portable first aid station or we can take it to mass casualty incidents and we'll have all the equipment we need to on site in one cache. Um, I spoke a little bit about ALS and the excitement we have with that going forward. Uh, I'm about a month or two behind in my timeline I had in my head is where that would be rolling out. There's been little hiccups with medical control, uh, memorandums, and uh, change in the doctor group at the hospital, which kind of caused us to pause and lag a little bit. But we're still going forward hard. Um, we had a very good discussion recently with the hospital on an MOU, and, and that'll be finalized soon at an ALS level, and it's really exciting. It's only been 20 years or so, so a couple months doesn't matter. Persistence is key. Um, uh, one of the big uh, initiatives that I've been really trying to is to make sure our equipment is in shape as it was last year. It was last year. Finance was instrumental in uh, helping us put out a procurement and get a contract for a mechanic that is a fire apparatus mechanic to come over and take care of our equipment. He comes from the Cape, comes three or four times a year, takes care of our stuff, makes sure that it doesn't become a bigger issue. The first year that I was in the position, we had to send an engine away and have the entire engine replaced. It wasn't cheap, um, the power plant. But when you're talking a almost million dollar piece of equipment now, $50,000 isn't a lot of money. Uh, he just recently caught an issue we're having with the sister truck. We were able to get that up. It's at the engine dealership now. It's gonna be considerably less to fix. So that's one of those pluses that we're having in maintenance and making sure the equipment 
is up to snuff. Um, we can't borrow a truck from next door or call next door, so it's really important that we have. And we've been very well supported by administration finance by you in the town with the equipment we have and it's it's been really appreciated we have some nice stuff in a really nice building as well um the other things we've been having with our personnel we have uh three new firefighters starting very soon um that'll reflect on this next budget when we get them away to the academy um just the academy cost for us uh whereas they go to stow mass the mass fire academy for the recruit program is 12 weeks that cost for one firefighter, the way we have it set up now is around $18,000. If we add another firefighter to that, it only adds about $8,000, $10,000 more. And the reason for that is the hotel. We were able to get a, a really good rate from a, a long-term stay for a two bedroom and we, we saved some money there. Um, but we're gonna be having three go to there. We have two going at the end of this uh, fiscal year. It'll carry through. Uh, so we're getting a very young department. We've also had some retire retirements and um, some people leaving. So, you know, our, our, our seniority age is, is rapidly going down. So. And, uh, yeah, the paramedics and the ALS, that's the exciting thing. And what's going to be is um, making sure that we take and continue to maintain that level of service. And that's a level of commitment um, that the town has shown in order to produce more uh, when, when it comes down to doing this, it really needs to be homegrown and, and not to sound just like what Chief Pittman said, but I have firefighters that are starting families, you know, and they want that backyard for their, for their child. Whether that's how that's accomplished, I'm not that expert. Um, but I've been working and trying to work with the people who are a little bit and to see if there is some solutions with that, that there could be. Um, help or how it is so we're trying to get ahead of that as well because if we uh, develop these paramedics and they can go somewhere else for the same money and, and be able to afford that house we're gonna we're gonna have a hard time maintaining our ALS so that'll be that revolving door that we're gonna have to work really hard at doing paramedics in this across the, the Commonwealth right now are a scarce commodity so chief I seem to remember from years past is it a fair generalization that the fire department tends a little bit to be more local Nantucketers sort of gravitate or seek a career in the fire department, whereas the police department has a tendency to have people recruited from Long Island. Is, is that a That's a nature of the job a little bit, I think. Um, it's a lot easier for us to take and recruit and train and have that local person become a firefighter than it is for a police officer. Um, just by the, the nature of the job. They have a very hard job. And one of the things that's, you know, really easy for us, and we, we jokingly say, when we show up, we're not going to lock you up. We're going to, you know, we're here to help you. You know, and the police officers are never, they're put in that same position of help, but it's usually at somebody else's cost because when they're called, the situation isn't the best in the world. When we're called, we're coming there strictly at, with an ambulance or a fire truck to solve a problem. And, and by the nature of the job, people kind of gravitate to us a little bit more. And that's one thing I didn't mention too, and I apologize, is our, um, we've been really trying to recruit call firefighters. Um, a lot of our call firefighters become full-time firefighters once they taste oh, a job and they like it. And uh, we have a, the deputy chief is running a firefighter one, two program right now that just recently started for about 10 people. Oh, cool. So, How does that work? Are they paid? Call firefighters are paid, it's, it's per call or per hour at $15 an hour as it stands right now, and, and hopefully it'll go up soon. <laughs> Joanna's children. <laughs> Joanna has two boys who will be there we next had, week. Yeah, we had a, <laughs> we have a, there is a junior firefighter program that was for a little bit of time. We have hopes of starting that up. Um, my fire prevention um, so officer hopefully will continue yeah. to do that soon. Um, but just they've been really busy in fire prevention too. Uh, for the past, so, the, so for the last calendar year of 2019, because I just have the numbers in my head because we just did it. Uh, we, we had one and a half inspectors because I had an inspector just come in in July in the first six months we did and they did just about a thousand inspections between the two of them between um, generation safe program safe which is the student 
awareness to fire education, uh, real estate smoke detector inspections, oil tanks, propane tanks, um, hospital drills, school drills. There's, there's a lot that they do. Um, two number questions or one, one number question. Mm -hmm. uh, on page 33 in the financial detail, just so I understand, the, uh, the, sa the permanent salary permanent line shows a $396,000 decrease. That's not including the ambulance reserve account salaries over to it. Okay, so there Last year they were rolled over, this year they have, yeah. And then the um, education incentive line with a $119,000 increase, is that due to your, your three people going to the uh, fire academy? Let me ask on that one. Yeah, it's accounting for the, um, as the people in the paramedic um, paramedic program, they once they hit metrics, they get certain stipend payments. We've included those because not everyone participating has reached those all of the stipend levels, and then once they become certified, they move to another. Um, okay. They move to another line on the chart, so we're accounting for all of those potential moves as they may happen this year. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I was just going to ask. Um, the utilities line in the budget here is that just fuel for trucks, or does that include utilities for the new building, or are those sit somewhere else? Utilities, as far as I'm concerned, are for the or with the budget, so. So I'd have to look at that one. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking sure. at it. It's 375 is the number. It's just been consistent. I was curious as to whether if the building is in that, when, that, when we need to budget more for utilities for a bigger building. <clears throat> I need my glasses. I'm on. I'm on. Oh. Yeah, I'm on page 28. And I'm looking at the utilities uh, line. It's been pretty consistent through the years at 375. Looks like we had a pretty good year last year. Um, I think that actually relates to the, um, if you look on page 30, let's see, 33, right? Yeah. Yeah. That um, is actually consistent with the, the fuel account. Okay, that's what I was asking, if it's just fuel. Yeah. And so where, where do the utilities for the building? They're all out of um, administration. So all the buildings. Okay, thank you. Chief, um, just I'm sure there's a, a, a method to your man this year, but on, on the budget, like for overtime, we have $518,000 for three years in a row, yet you go, you're coming in, you know, 100 and change below that every year. How do you determine oh, what you're going to budget? A lot of that becomes from absent positions that we've had. Uh, we've taken, one of the things I, I did when we first started, we set minimum staffings that were already in place, but then we added to the availability for people to take time off and restricted that number so that the number always gave us um, flexibility with call outs. Um, one thing that's really hard and is to come about is when we start having that number, we don't know what we're gonna have. Right now, currently I have, and honestly this budget I'm not totally comfortable with that we're operating right now. Um, I've had one person out extended absence. I've had a retirement. I've had uh, people going away to paramedic school. I have one out, um, sorry, two out on uh, medical leave, extended medical leave. I've had at least four, uh, I have two out on, three out extended medical leave. And I've had at least four other people out on back injuries or, or different joint injuries. So as we've been really lucky in the past with overtime, that hasn't always been the case. Um, but we've just had a fortunate couple of years coming through. So normally that number is, is not something that we, we leave on the table, shall I say. One other thing, is, and this is just nothing to do with the budget, but um, it was pointed out to me that all the pools that are going into town, well, everywhere on the island, um, that, and we have area, many areas that don't have proper fire hydrants, that putting a fire hydrant in at the same time as you put a pool in would be very inexpensive for a homeowner. Does that make sense to you? I, I don't know whether it's even true. That's a double-edged sword when it comes to fire prevention and water source activities because could it be relatively simple? Yes, um, but it has to be put in correctly. It has to be available not just to that person because really the only person that benefits is the homeowner itself unless they decide to share it. And I only think I've had one person decide to send out letters to all their neighbors so that will count as a water source for them. 
And what it does is it reduces their uh, property insurance, possibly, no guarantee. For us to be able to use that, um, logistically, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Um, if there was an incentive to the homeowner? No, the, the, incentive is, the incentive is there with their property insurance with their property insurance. But again, we, we did a test not all too long ago that I'm not sure the insurance company would even accept. Um, I've also had, there's an issue with, when you start talking about those with maintenance. Uh, we went to do a test on a tank about three months ago and it ran great for about a minute and a half and then stopped. And asked when the last time it was filled, they went, I don't know. Um, so that and the, the time we had it before, you could go up and grab the, the drafting point and it would move about a foot in every direction because somebody had hit it and broken it and never been fixed. So unless it's been recently tested, that's really controlled by the, the insurance companies requiring that. Good. Any other? Go ahead, Jenna. Mm -hmm. um, I know you had some issues with the building as it was being finished. Is that all resolved and no monies are needed to do anything additional? No money should be that I expect to do anything additional. Um, what we're having issues with is a high-tech heating system that pumps and computers and sensors and, and everything else and flows. Um, all the other little things you'd expect with any new facility is what we're dealing with now. Um, and and with warranty and claims, warranty. yeah. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much, Chief. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Good morning, Mark. Hi, how are you guys doing? Thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you for having us <laughs> and having you, me early. <laughs> you know that you know the drill, so we'll I just do. let you get I'd, going. I'd like to thank Brian for all the work him and his department put in. It's huge. This new uh, the new way we're doing it with OpenGov and the way the lines work on the, in the system, it's so much more efficient than uh, than the old way. Not that the old way was bad, but this is just so much better. Great. Thank you for uh, that. So I know that was a lot of hard work to get that done, but I appreciate it because it's easier for us to do it. Great. Thank you. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that's going to change for me the most and want to comment uh, next year is Heidi Holgate, our business manager, is retiring. Mm -hmm. So uh, she is so hugely important to me and to Bob, you know, before me. So it's a big, big, big shoes to fill. Uh, we're going to miss her. Uh, but we're going to uh, move Denise Allen up to business manager. Okay. Uh, she was the assistant business manager, so we kind of believe uh, if people don't don't have an opportunity to move up, they'll move out. So yeah. we'll move up in house and and do that. But we'll miss her. Yeah. And I'm happy uh, she gets to retire a little early. Yeah, it's great. She will be missed. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, so for for want of comment. Uh, 
one of the big changes in our budget this year on the revenue side is a uh, number of service connections. Um, we're guessing uh, quite a substantial drop off in service connections coming up. Uh, I can tell you in the last two weeks, I think we've done one service, and the next service on our schedule is until February 3rd. Oh, so we went from flat out two or three, four a week to one or two every new connections. Uh, also, we've reduced uh, the water revenue a little bit. Usually, we go up uh, six to eight percent on the water revenue fees, your water bill. We're going up 4%. What we're finding out in the last couple of three years since the advancement of Airbnb, VRBO, people are using their homes different this time of year. Uh, right now we have 25 to 2600 what we call dead meters. They're zero use meters. People aren't doing winter rentals anymore. Uh, that's 25% of our meters are sitting with no use the last two years, three years. So, you know, I think that's a link to directly to property use I mean, I think all of us know somebody that had the year-round house that's now doing an Airbnb or a VRBO. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. They've taken it off the year-round rental market, market uh, and they're going to... They're making more money with less wear and tear sure. on the property. Um, and I know all of us deal with seasonal fluctuation in business, uh, but we see a steady decline every year uh, in winter water use. And and I, I don't, I could be guessing wrong, but... I think that's kind of a link there. Why do you, are the connections down because the construction's all with wells? Well? No, no. Uh, I think construction's, I, I'm not going to say we're slowing down because if you drive around the island, it's still, everybody is still busy. But compared to what we were doing, uh, it was beyond busy before. It was almost out of control. Uh, now it's, I think people are catching up. So when I talk to, uh, we spend a lot of time talking to different contractors and excavation companies, masons, surveyors. You know, the surveyor is the first one to the job, no matter what the job is. Mm -hmm. uh, those guys are now oh. saying that their pile is actually, it's not growing anymore. You know, they're actually making headway on their pile of work. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if this is a, a beginning of the end thing or if this is <laughs> it's starting to slow down. So we kind of prepared our budget for that way, you know. Um, other items that are changed for Wanna Comet, uh, a few of the smaller things that are mandated by DEP. We had a metal pile, so in our rubbish removal, uh, we got a we had a small pad that we used to keep the stuff on. They want us to have metal roll-off dumpsters. We have to purchase that. That's a bigger expense to have, you know, a local guy come with their truck, haul it away. Um, we're doing more and more. On our own, our professional service line is, is dropping again with the training and the hiring that, that we've been doing. Uh, we're doing more and more on our own that we used to have to get help with, and I hope that continues. So we're saving money where we can. Um, one, of the, one of the bigger increases was in our water sampling line. Um, I know you're all aware of the, the PFAS. PFOA, PFOS, uh, that's a big thing in the water world right now. Uh, the regulations just came out. Sampling protocols are going to come. That sampling is extremely expensive. There are very few labs in the country that can do it down to when they talk t parts per trillion um, and parts per billion. I mean, that's, that's real small. Uh, yeah. And seeing as how there's such few labs that can do it, it's very, very expensive. Uh, but we've we've incorporated money with that, uh, and we've increased the uh, engineering equipment, survey equipment line. Uh, we're doing well again, doing more and more on our own. So we've started putting transducers in all of our monitoring wells that give us continuous monitoring of uh, different parameters that can show us contamination coming in or water quality parameters, looking for saltwater intrusion. Uh, we're going to start installing these same type of meters on our water mains. We can put them on gate valves out on the street, so it gives us continuous look on any leak survey. That way, if there is a leak, these will sense a pressure drop, and we can go out and fix it right away so we don't lose, lose our resource. Uh, but all in all, I think it's a pretty solid budget, and uh, we should be okay, and we're doing okay now. Our current projects are at, on North Liberty Street with... Uh, David in the sewer department, that seems to be going well. 
Uh, I think him and I continue to work. We're going to continue to work together uh, and bring in Rob McNeil with the DPW and Stormwater. And really, the capital projects moving forward, are, we're all going to be tied together. I hope the goal should be all of us tied mm -hmm. together. So we can go into one area like we're doing now, finish it, be done with it, and move on. Uh, resurface it curb to curb, end up with a brand new road, all brand new utilities underneath it, and we can be done in the North Liberty Street area, if, you know, hopefully for decades. Uh, yeah. Mark, I, think it's a, I seem to remember in years past, Bob, and then maybe you last year talked about a water rate study. Is there yep, we do have a water rate study. It's complete. Uh, we're not going to have a water rate increase, even though the study says we needed one two years ago. Uh, we are looking at raising one of the biggest demands on the system right now is fire service connections. And as Chief Murphy just kind of alluded to, uh, they, they get a discount. Now it's regulation that a lot of these commercial buildings have to have them. That puts a big demand on our system because those require a certain PSI to work. Mm -hmm. So for us to do that, that might be in certain areas that might be changing out a, a small water main uh, to a bigger water main. Uh, increasing the flow, increasing the pumpage, uh, those aren't just a service connection where we're supplying a little bit of water to a residence. That, that's a number that we have to meet for those people to get their insurance. So if we change anything in 2021, we've been kicking around the idea of increasing those by about 3%, the fire service connection. If you look at the rates across the state, uh, we're not even on the map. Most people are charging more quarterly than what we charge all year. I'm not saying we'll go out and increase it. You know, I don't want to do a huge increase to businesses right away and jam it. But that, if, if, anything, if anything is raised because of what we have to do to meet those numbers, it would be the fire service connection. And I was looking at about a 4% increase, 3 or 4%, if we, if we do it. If it's not 2021, it'll be 2022. But we, it's putting a demand on the system. Yep. And I think that's been something that's been it's away for a couple of years. A couple of years. Draw, we, draw yeah, we've been waiting since 2010. <laughs> uh, our 20-year 20, 20 permit ran out in 2012. Uh, we do have word that is actually off the pile and on somebody's desk, and I was told that uh, maybe by March we'll have our official signed document permit. We're still under uh, our old permit right now. But in your, in your hand up in the presentation, you talk about you, you finally convinced the MDEP that yeah. there's a sort of a, uh, what, a seasonality issue that needs to be taken into account. Yes, so what they, uh, they never really took into account the difference between uh, now and July. Uh, they gave you a little bit. So they say our year-round population, based on their numbers, or, or our seasonal top peak summer day, is like 34,000 people. Uh, we all know that's... I mean, we're probably closer to that now in the winter. I know we're not at, I mean, we're in the high teens, and uh, we'll find out the census is going on now, but it took a lot of convincing and uh, offering boat tickets for them to come over in July and August and take a look. There's more than 34,000 people here, so that their, their number they give us is strictly based off population. It doesn't take into any account that... Uh, a big weekend like pops and you might have people coming over maybe just for the day that doesn't take into account for day trippers you know who are using water in restaurants and and different facilities it didn't take into account a lot of it and I, we weren't alone on that there were some other towns on the cape that got involved so they gave everybody on the cape and islands like a like a 10 percent and for us closer to a 15 percent buffer that increased that number if you could prove you know that that their number was wrong, so we were able to do that. It luckily we did, uh, because the number they gave us, we we wouldn't have been able to pump water at that level and supply proper demand to everybody. So my final question is: I, I know that the merger of Wisconsin Water and the Water Comet is is finally going to happen. It is. Uh -huh, we. Never made it to the final reading again. Um, we're back in the pile. So it's a yearly thing. Uh, this will be our fourth or fifth time 
going through the motions again. Uh, we've, we'll put in an article at town meeting for the same thing. Uh, the ad will go in the inky again for the same thing. And then they start the pile over. Uh, I will say word from, from the state level is that Nantucket puts in more paperwork than any other town in the Commonwealth when it comes to uh, home rule petitions. So um, I'm not saying they dislike us. I'm just saying I don't know if some of our things move through their pile really fast. Yeah. But uh, we'll, we'll do it again. Um, we can get into Sconset a little bit if you want. Uh, it's a, it, we're treating Sconset as a, a, almost another pump station. I mean, it's just a, okay. it's just a maintain and work on what we got. I, I guess I was curious <coughs> if it ever happens. Is, are there, is there really savings to be achieved, or is it, um, is it all managed really as one business anyway? So. It's pretty much managed as one business anyway. The way we could do it is if, uh, <laughs> if it was really under our control and we combined, combined everything, there there could be savings on some sampling costs and dealing with the lab and trying to get better deals and. But we're not talking huge, significant, major savings with the merger. Uh, I think business-wise, it helps us a little bit. And it's a little bit less paperwork <laughs> if we're all together. But as far as a real cost savings, you still you still got to pay the power. You're still going to run the pumps and maintain the system. So there's not a, a huge financial benefit from the merger, except for the number of customers out there is so small. Uh, and I talk about want to comment having 25% of their meters off this time of year. Well, Sconset, I think there's only 100 or so on. Um, <laughs> the pump comes on about every four or five days. So they're, they're doing 60, 70,000 gallons every, maybe 100,000 gallons every four or five days. There's not a lot of people out there. Uh, their debt service is pretty big. We had to do some, I mean, they condemned the tank. We had to build a new water tower. Uh, we had to put in all the meters. The um, retirement costs as well. Yep, you know, the, yeah. had to do all that. And uh, it's a lot for 800 customers to pay. That's why the rate is what the rate is. It's in the top third of the state. It's, you know, nine bucks for 750 gallons. Uh, we're $4. And the thought, uh, if we did combine, you know, at some point it would be nice to have one rate, not two rates, and try to work and not meet in the middle and have want to comment customers have to pay for everything in Sconset, but maybe the merger would decrease their rate out there a little bit in a way that we could kind of pool together and help it out a little better. I have a question about the new yep. like No, no, about 115, 120. Okay. Uh, there was one year a few years ago we were pushing 200. Uh, we missed that one a lot. We uh, This year... We budgeted for the current year we're in, we budgeted for 100 new connections. And in the beginning, uh, I was worried that that was going to be really, really low. I mean, we were going gangbusters there for a while. Um, and looking at the stuff just this week, we have probably, to meet our number, we need 15 new connections to come in the door between now and July. And I just told you the next one is until February 3rd. We did less. We did we did fifty two or fifty three service connections, new service connections, okay, instead of a hundred. We had a, we've always been around that hundred during this boom, and in a few years we were over a hundred. A few years ago we were one hundred and nineteen, one hundred and twenty. Um, it's been slowing down and slowing down and slowing down, and now it's it's slow. As far as new service connections go, it's slow. What's that? What well, we will, yeah. No, and and uh, some of those numbers, you know, Richmond's moving along on their projects, so they came in the other day and set up 30, 30 <coughs> service accounts. Uh, so I mean, it, I think we'll hit that number, uh, but it's definitely, definitely changing, and I don't know if it's a permitting thing or a project thing where things are at a point. Or it's a schedule thing, or if it's an actual slowdown thing. Each meter is a connection. Yes. So a new connection would be a new meter, new connection. Uh, that, and fire services are probably our, our <coughs> fastest growing section.
Good. And any other questions for Mark? Thank you, Thank Mark. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot. Mr. Gray, you're up. Morning. I don't know if you want me to wait until Denise to get back. I think you can go ahead and get started. Well, seeing that you guys were just talking about uh, connections, I'll jump right on on those a little bit. Um, I'm a little different than Mark this year, as we have the whole Shimmel project and plus parcel project that went live um, last spring. So uh, we've already had. Um, over 105 permits issued for the Shimon um, Nantucket Harbor Plus project parcels. Um, that includes some grinders and gravity. Um, <clears throat> to date, we're already we're at 300 um, permits issued to date now, and last year we had 270 total for the year. Um, so we're uh, we're a little opposite of what Mark's doing. We're we just sewered a bunch of areas, so we're having new connections, and most of those areas already had water, so they're already they had water and now they're getting sewer so uh our uh, permitting is just um <clears throat> going way up um which will continue for a few years because the um there's over 400 parcels alone <clears throat> just in the uh that shimmel project area so um would you say over three we probably got three or four years of <clears throat> a boom so. no no no. Uh, how many did you say you had this year <clears throat> total permits this year already are over 300. yeah okay. And fiscal year 19, we had 270. And um, I think there's, when I left yesterday, I think there was 10 or 12 more sitting there for my review <clears throat> to um, issue. They are, and <clears throat> it's a fairly slow process because there's not a whole lot of contractors that have free time on their hands. So, um, <clears throat> Once they come in with their, their permit and their uh, plan, <clears throat> we try to turn it around within 14 days. And then some of those connections are taken anyways from six months to a year and a half to take place. It's just because of scheduling. Um, so that the, uh, <clears throat> our, our crew, our inspectors are out there every day. They're probably doing four or five inspections a day. Um, and we inspect everything. Someone lifts a house and raises it to put a foundation in we inspect it as a disconnect. We have to make sure they cut it off right, cap it. <clears throat> and then when they go back to reset it, we have to go back again to do the connection to make sure it was done properly. Um, <clears throat> Correct, and that's for two years, from the date it went live, and it went live in April of last year, well, <clears throat> this year, so they have, it's $500 per permit. It's per structure, it's per permitted structure. And then they can they can purchase grinder pumps at a discounted rate of fifteen hundred dollars, um, and that's for two years. Anything after two years, the, the rates go up to the normal rates. Um, in the Shimo area specifically, they're a nitrogen sensitive area, so they they had six months to pull a permit. They had to pull a permit within six months. <clears throat> Technically, they had to connect within six months. It's impossible. There's too many people, too many connections to be made in six months. So. <clears throat> with myself and Roberto, we gave them, you know, at least apply for six in six months. Your permit's valid for a year, and you can get a year extension, but they had to pull a permit, and most of those people have complied. Um, the um, <clears throat> Going along with the um, uh, the permitting and stuff like that, it's, it's, it's going well. <clears throat> and Mark touched a little bit on Sconset, and again, we're also seasonal in Sconset. <clears throat> uh, this time of year, we're receiving about 9,000 gallons a day <clears throat> and we actually have to feed the plant with either raw influent sewage from the treatment plant in Sconset or we have to buy a supplemental um, carbon source to feed it. Um, we've used goat food, dog food, horse food. Um, <clears throat> there are other chemicals on the on the market but they're three four thousand dollars a tote to feed the plant so we try to we use brew waste. <clears throat> so you have to actually have to 
put carbon source in to feed to keep the bacteria, bacteria. Bi biology and what, what is our horse food budget <laughs> <laughs> now the uh, we, just, we really don't we take and try to not use a lot of the the products that are off the shelf because of the byproducts that are in them yeah. um, <clears throat> you get a good a carbon source with like goat food because they're high in um, syrups and sugars but then you get the byproducts which turn into sludge which means we have to haul it and treat it so um, brew waste works well and um, the other thing that we do is <clears throat> we consistently feed the plant with one load of leachate 5,000 gallons of leachate every couple of weeks we dump it in strategic spots around the town what that helps do is flush the mains so anything that's settling out with low flows we feed it and it flows down to the plant and it gives us a big alkalinity so our biology needs bacteria and, <clears throat> and alkalinity so um, but so that's pretty much Sconset. Um, the uh, um, we did a rate study. You guys talked about a rate study. We did a rate study, and we've in, we've initiated uh, an increase in June. Uh, I mean, sorry, in January first, we had an increase of approximately ten percent um, for our sewer rates. <clears throat> and in June, we're working on a, a project now with Brian and our, and our consultant to a to a tiered rate structure. Summertime, the people that use more water will be paying more. The people who use less water, it's going to be a balancing act of how we get it going. Um, we're still working with Ryan on it. <clears throat> it was one that went in January that's fresh. That's yeah. Yes. yes. Is that taken account into the is that increase in the fiscal twenty one? Yes. And then the um, look at the summary. There's right now there's eight hundred thousand in retained earnings used to balance it, but we're working on Hazen and Sawyer based on this budget to input it and then working on rateably reducing that at various levels to see what the rate will look like and we're talking we're creating a new tier structure of at least probably five tiers but more like seven or eight tiers to try to create affordability across the spectrum and for the really high super users of the um, of the system to be paying rateably more as, as you go across blocks and the expectation and the plan is, is that as we move through this budget cycle, we will present that to the sewer commissioners for approval so that it would become effective on July 1st of 2000, uh, for 21. And, and sort of a higher level question, if, if looking at whatever basis is, you know, the, the 20 budget is showing a $670,000 operating loss net earnings. Yeah, and, and you, you, you put a, a increase on the operating loss for the next rest of the year is expected to increase even with a rate increase. Uh, at this point, but we're going to, it does kind of be, we're, we're going to fix that by correcting it. When the rate is changed and this hasn't, because we don't, it's difficult for us to project when everybody pulls the permit, when they're going to connect and start being a contributing user to the system. There's some lag time that we, that's accounted for with a little bit higher loss there but will be recouped when all of these 300 permits actually have actually connected to the system and are actually utilizing it. It'll also be a change too that will be able to be accounted for once they, because you also have to remember that they're also paying the veteran, the English fee of $6,300. And that's not accounted for here because they haven't been billed yet. So I don't know when a person has the option of paying it all off or paying 10% and then amortizing the remainder over 20. So there's some other changes to revenue that as we go through will actually will mitigate that eight hundred thousand dollars in retained earnings but like i said we're also looking at how to spread that into the rate and, and maybe cut it down knowing that some of those other things will also actually impact it and we ultimately would be using less retained earnings there's just a lot of timing with having three four five hundred new connections to the system and not knowing exactly when they're going to be contributing users into the system at this time and without looking at all the detail, is what's driving the sort of the operating loss? Is it debt and debt service? Is it, it service people is, cost, or is it just operating costs? It's operating costs and, and increased personnel or increased. There's some other initiatives that David has has, has included in terms of OSHA trainings and other things. So there's operating costs that have increased. And the debt service actually is <coughs> slightly here, but it's going to actually go down a little bit. But um, there will be more debt in the future that will come on and I'll obviously increase that as well. Yeah. And one of the other, yeah. Another thing with the operating budget, uh, we just completed our sewer regulations update, 
and in that in the new regulations, once approved by the um, sewer commissioners, has some new rate structures in there for not only connection fees, but one of that one of our biggest contributors just to overtime and some of our operating costs are uh, sewer backup callouts. Um, currently, we're not we don't charge for our, our services, and ninety percent of our calls are not the town's problem. They're in people's laterals or their their houses. Um, and that takes a lot of resources and a lot of manpower. I was out till 1030 last night with a backup on Westchester Street where um, two of the manholes over the years have been covered over. We can't find them. <clears throat> and I have a crew up there now with the camera truck and uh, we're sending a piece of equipment up there that if we have to dig somebody's garden up to find a manhole, that's what we're going to be doing today. So um, <clears throat> that's increased a lot and we're going to have the ability to, if the regulations are approved, to um, charge people. Um, we'll tell them if, if you had your plumber been there. And a lot of times <clears throat> they say, no, we just called you. Um, we're gonna make, we won't respond. Uh, we'll have one guy go check to make sure our main's flowing, but we won't fall, do a full deployment of people unless the plumber's already gone there. Um, and that's one thing that's already started. It starts with dispatch. It's a, one of the first questions the police ask, have you contacted your plumber? Has your plumber been there? And then they relay that to us. Uh, so it's getting better now about 50% of the time the plumber's already been there or is on the way so um, So that's going to be another uh, potential revenue um, <clears throat> being able to go out and If it's not our problem or there's a break in a private line Which there's still are quite a few private lines out there and they can't get a contractor to fix it We'll be able to go out and fix it and, and charge a fee for it um, David, could you talk a little bit about the um, salaries? So your 2020 budget was a couple hundred thousand dollars lower than 2019 actuals, and then now you're back up against the, <clears throat> now you're a little bit higher than 2019 actuals, but definitely higher than the 2020 budget. So do you have more people? We have, um, we actually had a retirement from a long-term, one of our long-term uh, operators is retired. Um, <clears throat> and then, during that year, we were down. We had three or four positions that were empty. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we've since filled all those positions. Okay. And um, it's worked out quite well. And like what Mark said, um, <clears throat> we try to find you know, the homegrown, the people that already have housing. Um, we actually have housing on site. We have two um, duplexes on site that we built in the 2008 with the upgrade. <clears throat> um, something that we'd look forward to and the next upgrade that comes up would be to potentially put a couple more duplexes in mm -hmm. um, so we can retain operators. I just had one of my senior operators the other day, for example, say that, you know, <clears throat> they went off on this weekend looking for a house to purchase. They can't purchase one here. They're actually living in our housing now. So they've been able to save a little bit, but they're going off island to look for a house. So I could lose a senior operator. I don't know yet. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things too, um, Denise, is that the first lines of the budget shows um, an increase in salaries and whatnot, but if you look down a little bit lower under sewer collection, um, there's a, a reduction of salary. So okay. the net is not, it, it's not really a $358,000 increase in the salary. It's just the, everybody's being coded to the top lines versus being broken out through okay. there with the exception of sconces. So that, that's where some of that comes from okay. as well. Yeah. Thank you. And the sconced operator is the one who retired. <clears throat> And he was the highest tier he could be. So we now have a junior operator in that position, which is definitely, a, it's a decrease in that. Mm -hmm. So it, it moves back and forth. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, David. The, um, we have a lot going on right now. We, um, <laughs> that's really an understatement, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> and there's a lot of stuff that's, and there's been some stuff that's been on the books. We have that Baxter Road sewer still on the books. It's been there for, for years and we've tried to keep that rolling along. And <clears throat> if we hit the threshold out there of the 25 feet from the traveled way, it's gonna trigger closures of the road, discontinuous of services and uh, utilities. <clears throat> we already have a plan, draft plan, to build a new sewer on the <clears throat> town side of Baxter Road down below the bluff, which would end up people would have to take and <clears throat> divert all their sewer from one way, but the town would have to provide them services um, portions of that will be funded by uh, Sconset residents and the SPPF people. So that's that's one that you've seen on numerous years. It's just mm -hmm. a lot of times we're just waiting. And this year we haven't seen a big um, jump in erosion in that specific area. 
However, we've seen erosion in two spots by our plants where things have changed. So um, we've had a lot of accretion over the years, but this year with some of the some of the strange storms that we've had with strong southeast winds for days or, or nor'easters for days have seen some impact in, in certain spots of the island. Um, which, the, I'm sorry, David, which part of the island do you think is most vulnerable at this point from your perspective? You really can't. It's, it, it changes so often and so Does quickly it? every year. I mean, in Sconset, we had accretion for the past 10 or 15 years in front of our discharge beds. And this year we had a three-day nor'easter that everything was just high tides and everything where we actually lost one of our sampling wells. It came in and it took the beach, the bluff out. We lost, we lost 26 feet in three days. We gained back 12, but we still have a well now that's out of commission that we have to replace. <clears throat> Same thing here at Surfside. We haven't seen hardly any erosion in front of the Surfside beds <coughs> from south shore to my comet, but this year we, hit, we had a hit of 18 feet in one day. So, um, and then you're getting a buildup in Madiket. It's, it's, it's changes so fast, mm -hmm. and, you know. Um, but with, you know, with tide increases or, you know, <clears throat> ocean levels rising uh, and everything else that we're looking at all that and, you know, for our resiliency and everything like that. So anytime we do something now, we're thinking resiliency and water protection. We did that with the C Street pump station. We have that complete facility surrounded by a structural flood wall. So if the water was to rise, we're already five feet above the flood level in the FEMA maps. So... <clears throat> Everything we do, we're looking ahead. Um, we have a sewer master plan underway right now, which is looking at the entire island for all the flows, projected, current and projected flows, um, with current as, as it is now with current zoning. Um, most of the big property areas are gone. There's still a couple here and there. There's one up on North Mill Street, a big one that's, you know, eight lot subdivision that's going in. And, yeah. Um, so... <clears throat> From time to time, we might have a, a little bit of a lull, but then we have a big subdivision like that come in. Mm -hmm. um, we have the uh, the CMOM program. This is our third year in the CMOM program. We've already CCTV'd over 200,000 linear feet. We're doing about another 100,000 and 100, 130,000 this year. That'll um, can be ongoing as we're under a consent order from EPA still. So we have to meet all those demands. Um, we're getting close to being able to hopefully close that out. Um, we, how would you characterize sort of overall capacity of the, the surf side? And, you know, are we, in terms of the peak flows, are we at 50% of capacity, 80% of capacity? I'm just sort of curious how, how you look at it or how we could look at it. The um, treatment plant itself is permitted for 4 million gallons a day. And it's not necessarily the facility that's our, our limiting factor, it's the discharge beds. The, the discharge beds are permitted for 4 million a day. Um, we just received our, our discharge permit after seven years, uh, a couple months ago. Um, so now we have a current discharge permit. Uh, there were some additional requirements put on our permit that we shouldn't have any problem meeting. But the facility itself just underwent one upgrade, a phase one upgrade, to take and handle potential future flows from uh, Madiket and all the needs areas. <clears throat> all the flows are already calculated in the flows at the plant for the needs, the listed need needs areas in the CWMP. And we saw peak flows last summer of um, 2.7 million gallons a day, which is higher than we have seen in the past years. Um, and we have, we have had a lot of rain this year. So our numbers are still, uh, we still have II that we're taking out of the system with the CMOM program. Um, so the, uh, the summer was extremely busy. So, so the beds are 4 million, are the, are then that's limiting factor the plant itself actually could do <clears throat> The plant itself was designed for 7.7 .7 max. Um, we've seen times when we have heavy flooding or rains down in the town area where we've had over 12 million gallons instantaneously coming into the plant <clears throat> for a couple of hours. And it, it taxes us, but it goes away quickly. Once the flooding starts to subside or the rain stops, the flows go back to normal. So we have peak hits, but then they'll slow down. Um, <clears throat> one thing that's changed um, in town, and we have some uh, construction going on this year down in town, is we're going to be doing some more II removal, the inflow and infiltration in the Eastern Street area. So our numbers theoretically should go down when we start taking water out. <clears throat> but that means water will be going either trying to get pumped into our system or it'll be going more into the stormwater, which will increase stormwater flows. And, you know, they're limited as well. Um, 
We have an ongoing, we just started our Sconset uh, Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan. Um, when they did the 2014 Sconset, wasn't really part of that. So we're doing one now specifically for Sconset. And uh, almost all of the Sconset infrastructure that's out there was between 1912 and 1920. Hmm. So it's old, and a lot of times it goes through people's houses uh, on private property. So when we have camera that whole system out there, and we're looking at doing a lot of construction out there to realign, put sewers where they belong, not in people's houses. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on that with the uh, CWMP in Sconset. Um, the, uh, we have a couple of exceptions in the capital that you, you probably saw in one of the bigger ones was um, the uh, you know, Surfside Road area improvements that we already have some funding for. We are looking for an additional $2 million um, to meet construction demands. Uh, costs are just skyrocketing as far as um, construction goes. And um, one of our biggest costs that we find now in any of our construction projects is uh, paving. Yeah. Um, paving for like the Schimmel project alone was well over $2 million. Um, we're looking at uh, probably that much just in the Surfside Road area when we do that project. So <clears throat> those costs have gone up tremendously. Um, so asphalt still has to come from off island. I'm looking at Rob in the back too. Um, asphalt still comes from off island. Well, Victor is a local vendor okay. contractor, but all his aggregate has to come from the mainland. Yes, okay. in all this, and that's really been challenging for a lot of our projects together is um, paving. Um, the uh, we have a, a, a South Shore Road exception in there for you know, one point five million dollars. That's in there as kind of a uh, precursor for if anything happens with the um, Surfside Crossing, the subdivision that could go in. It's also going to take in help for um, future flows and capacities for Madiket and all the other areas to try to get the um, the uh, sewage to the plant. Uh, what are membrane upgrades? The membrane upgrades are, uh, it's our final, it's ultra filtration. We have two micron filtration at the treatment plant and uh, they're uh, very sensitive to uh, any kind of chemicals or whatever like that. So we have to be very careful with what we allow to come into the facility. They look like spaghetti tubes. They're hollow core tubes that <clears throat> they suck the water out of the, the um, mixed liquor, which, which we call it, which are our mixed base of our sewage. And that's what produces our clean water. I don't know how many here have come out for tours. And once you see it, you, it's pretty remarkable. They, the water's clear. It looks like drinking water when we're done. Um, the normal lifespan for um, membranes of 2 micron are 10 years. Um, that's stretching it for 10 years. Those odds that were put in in 2008. And because we are so religious with our cleanings and our chemical usage, um, we're still operating well within a safe zone, but the other night we had a call out at two o'clock in the morning because we had some high TMP. They're starting now to show their age, so we've got this in there this year. Um, it's a it's a <clears throat> significant project because we have to hire a crane from the mainland of a hundred tons with a with a, a long reach because they have to reach it from outside the 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 deck area, which is about sixty feet. We have no uh, on island cranes that can do it and that crane's well over ten thousand dollars a day so this is about a week long uh just replacement project so um, that's why that number's in there um and just, you have to do both the road area improvement and the membrane upgrade to handle surf site problems no the the membrane is just we're at it it's it's, it's yeah, over it's you still have to spend that time. we still have to do that the membranes yeah they because when they fail, they're going to fail catastrophically, and it's going to take in, that will really hinder our process. So those are something that we've been working on. We've worked with a, a manufacturer that, and the, the original vendor. Sorry about that. I'm actually on call, on call as well. So, um, but um, <laughs> exactly. I, I, I'm lucky. That with one of the reasons, and the, the reason why, like I'm on call is. In order to be on call for our facility, because we're a grade six facility, um, you have to have grade six operators. We have a fairly young and new staff, and I only have two operators in the union that are grade sixes or sevens. Um, so I can't expect them to be on call all year long, the two of them. So um, <clears throat> myself and our chief operator will rotate in with the list, and this just so happens to be 
my week. So, um, but the, uh, and that's one of the things in our training and our, some of our budget stuff and, and training and OSHA safety is because now we're in OSHA state, we have to meet OSHA regulations, something we never had to do before. We were always, we always followed the federal guidelines, but we didn't have to comply with inspections and stuff. And, and that now is underway. So we've had a pretty significant jump in our, uh, our professional um, training and our uh, OSHA safety stuff that you'll see. Um, and that's only just to, just to meet current regulations and training. We have all of our training. We're trying to bring all of our training on the island now. And when we do training on the island, we incorporate all the other departments, water, uh, waste, uh, storm water, fire, police. We try to bring everybody in to give them some of our training. Any other questions for David? The lab that you need to upgrade samples, I guess. The lab upgrade is something that we try to take and do little pieces at time at a year. Um, and another thing with, like Mark was talking about the PFAS, it's not only going to come to drinking water, it will eventually come to the, the, uh, the wastewater and leachate from the landfill or whatever like that. <laughs> so what we're doing is we're preparing for that. Um, we won't be able to do a lot of the testing here. Like Mark said, it's extremely expensive. Yeah. And on average, uh, you know, for just doing the tests that we do, an, an average piece of equipment's anywhere between 26 and 50 something thousand dollars. And they only last for four or five years. So. We try to move along slowly. The numbers in there, but that's the numbers that's kind of in there just just in case this PFAS stuff comes more. Um, but and, you're your only customer, right? For that. No, currently now, if um, if natural resources or someone has a uh, if they have a call form hit or something at one of the beaches or whatever like that, they can bring their samples to us and we can test them at our facility. Mm -hmm. They've done that often. Um, but one of the things that we going forward is in our new discharge permit. Um, DEP was pretty clever, I'll say, and they added um, a whole bunch of testing parameters for us, and some of it's stuff that we can't do. We actually have to have um, natural resources do because they want us to sample four or five locations in the harbor. They want us to t sample all the, the ponds now. Um, we tried to get that out of our permit, but it was the way they said it, it was the only way we could get some data that we, we wanted that um, we didn't have, so now we have other mandates that we have to do with with Jeff Carlson, and they increased all of our sampling for all of our test wells. We now have to do them monthly instead of um, quarterly. So that's where you're seeing the increases in the wastewater lab stuff. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you Thanks a lot. Thank you. You guys are probably seeing a lot of activity on the road, so there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, we do see. <laughs> we don't Thank doubt you. you are busy. Thank you for everything you do. Yeah, you too. Please grab a donut on the way out. Please. It looks like nobody's eaten anything up there. You guys are not living up to my expectations. <laughs> Good morning, Rob. As I keep saying, there's pastries and coffee in the back, so maybe even on your way out. Cause oh, thank you. Grab as many as you want. <laughs> That's really the message. That would be zero. <laughs> I have Ziploc bags if you need to take doggy okay. bags off. <laughs> I came prepared. Well, um, I have been told to keep it brief, <laughs> which is a challenge for me. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do a, a couple brief uh, overviews, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Um, so, as uh, Mark and David both mentioned, uh, you know these departments are uh, growing. Uh, we're responding to more and more requests, uh, both from the public and from, um, you know, it, we, we always hear the term unfunded mandates. There's all kinds of uh, new initiatives happening all the time, and uh, we're trying to get work done in very limited pockets of time uh, with some pretty serious constraints on us. Uh, everything from availability of asphalt, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, to boats not running and supplies uh, not coming. So there's a lot of pressures on us uh, to perform. Uh, staffing and keeping staff uh, trained and up uh, appropriately with OSHA regulations, et cetera, uh, housed and uh, available here on island. 
is uh, an ongoing challenge as well. So uh, with all of that, uh, last year, uh, Public Works responded to, uh, developed and responded to uh, over, uh, just under, I should say, 4,000 work orders, uh, up about 18% uh, from the previous year. And we're doing it with less staff. So uh, we've been forced uh, to become more efficient and to try to streamline as, as best we can. Uh, I have a number of examples. Uh, I think a combination of things. Uh, one thing I think was definitely outreach. Uh, we're sort of promoting our service request system now uh, to, to get not only just the public uh, into a system that uh, for their ability to report to us more detail, uh, to give the ability to interact and communicate back and forth. Uh, not just, hey, there's a pothole here at this location, thank you, hang up. It's more, <laughs> you have the ability now to uh, report in with photographs. Uh, we can, uh, if you provide your phone number and email, uh, we can keep you posted as to the status of the service request. And the service request is really just the, the first piece of the puzzle. Uh, we'll investigate each request and uh, ultimately determine uh, its validity. We've, there's a tiered approach from emergency down to sort of back burner type work. And of course, everything gets reported in as an emergency. <laughs> so we give everything, we give the data for them to read through if they choose not to and just go right to emergency. Uh, that's one of the big things is to understand um, how urgent this is. And then uh, if, it, if it ultimately is a our responsibility, you know, it's a public road or some other related topic, um, or something that needs to be programmed uh, on a weekly basis. Each one of our divisions will uh, work together um, with the, the management to be able to determine uh, the order of precedence and prioritize uh, those into a work order. And then from there, it goes from there. So what we're seeing, though, is a, uh, a slight tapering for the last three years that we've been doing this. Uh, we're seeing that we're not, we're, we're, we're falling away from near 100% uh, for the year of work orders that are generated and completion of those. So uh, it's a combination of, I think, the, the sheer number and volume that uh, we're seeing increases of, and at the same time, uh, some of the challenges of not having uh, adequate staff levels. So we're starting to taper off. Uh, we're, we're falling uh, on the order of about 5%. So, so to get back to the beginning of that, though, you, you feel like it's, it's more that you've made making service requests easier to do and sort of better promoted as opposed to more potholes or, I, I, I don't know what kind of service requests you get, but I think potholes are the one that come, comes to mind for me. But it's, there isn't a particular category of service request that has gone up 18%. It's just more that in total people are making, Correct. are better aware of what you'll do. So. I would say so, yes. We're not, we're not seeing any massive trends in one particular category or another. Uh, that are leading us to believe that there's some new change. I think it is a combination of outreach and just letting people know that um, we're here for you, but we, we'd really appreciate if you utilize this form of communication to initiate uh, service requests so that the system functions better. It, and it doesn't happen overnight, you know, particularly with uh, even just I internally. Uh, the departments that rely on us for facilities updates and uh, renovations and that sort of stuff, and stuff that gets reported to other departments that are just trying to pass along to us. We're, we're really trying to incorporate all of those into work requests, uh, uh, service requests, um, the people that uh, stop me in stop and shop, <laughs> that sort of stuff. Um, it, so it is handy to have. Uh, it's, so it's, it's nice to hand them my card, tell them to hit the website, and send it in as a service request. Um, so that's that's the system. You go to the DPW website and there's a form to fill out. You that's right. Stop and shop. And then you know, yeah, yeah, you right. go to stop and shop. You get Rob as he's yeah. coming out of his yes. car. Yeah, it's it's through the DPW website. Gotcha. Well, I usually catch you on the boat. So. <laughs> that's right. Uh, it's good. I, I it's it's constant um, constant feedback, which is it's nice to hear what's going on. Uh, but we have been in a real assessment mode for quite some time, uh, looking at systems. I know David, um, David and I have 
shared some contracts for uh, the closed circuit television uh, for the pipe assessment programs. Um, and it's, it's been very helpful information to, to start to build a true picture of our underground infrastructure uh, that has basically sat in place for many, many, many years. Um, we're beginning to finally address a lot of uh, specific drainage issues that have been ongoing. And we're really focusing on incorporating not just quick fixes, but solutions, real solutions, long-term um, corrections of uh, issues that have been longstanding. So uh, occasionally we solve one and it just re it feels really good because the people that have been affected negatively by it for so long uh, truly appreciate it. And they, they understand that we're we're definitely taking a different approach now in not just uh, symptomatic, but really root cause uh, systems. So we're, we're solving problems as opposed to just taking a, a half measure. Um, I ask this is something of a silly question, but um, on about the fourth page, the summary budget for the last couple of years, there's a category that's called safety uniform ammunition. <laughs> really? That looks like it's probably a carryover from the police department. The, the ammunition line, when we converted to the, the open gun platform, some names got merged, and I thought we could talk them all about the CBW does not actually have ammunition. Well, it's actually, good. he I does. Think so, but I, 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 was, was, I got a chuckle so when I saw it. So. Yeah. 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 Th think twice about calling something an emergency that isn't. <laughs> 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 that is, that's a good catch, though. Good catch, Joe. Um, we have gone into most of the capital, uh, and, and I'll, I know we're getting off uh, budget, but most of the capital items that we're pursuing is really trying to uh, address it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we have some real challenges and uh, we're continuing to invest in a lot of the infrastructure that's there, uh, including uh, vehicles and equipment. Uh, one of the things that both uh, finance and public works admin has been focused on for the last three years really is to uh, take a look at each individual line item within the DPW budget and to make sure that staff is uh, appropriating, or not appropriating, but uh, uh, billing expenses to the specific line item that's appropriate. Uh, what happened years ago was if something, uh, some line item had been spent out sometime during the year, um, even though that item should have been categorized in that line item, it, it was just, it went to a different line item that still had some uh, budget unspent. So it's, it's been difficult to track appropriately um, what, where money had been spent um, and ultimately we're responsible for the bottom line. But when we go back to actually budgeting, it's, it's important for me and for finance, I think, to understand exactly what our needs are for each line item. So we've been back to that and really focused on that for the past few years so we can better budget. Uh, this year, uh, we've taken a look and made adjustments based on previous year actuals. Uh, so we've done a fair amount of reductions of line items, uh, which ultimately get offset with some other increases that we're requesting in other lines. Uh, just as a, if you're following through, I mean, we go back to the 18 budget and 18 actuals. So it's starting to um, show that trend that we've been investing time in uh, with staff and with finance. Rob, on your capital items, the um, permanent traffic data collection station, seeing as traffic data is a, is a traffic data, parking data, we have the Act Now talking about a traffic survey. Could you talk about what these are? Sure. Please. Uh, essentially, it's a static um, uh, fisheye lens camera. Okay. And it runs continuously 24-7. Uh, it will be streaming data. Um, looking at pedestrian, um, uh, bicycle, 
uh, and vehicle data. Uh, basically taking it in with the video, mm -hmm. the, video. Uh, the computer system basically will analyze mm -hmm. everything that it's taking in and it can monitor multiple sectors simultaneously. Okay. Uh, so it recognizes, again, everything from pedestrians uh, to baby carriages uh, to actually can identify specific vehicle types. So okay. it can distinguish between a, a truck and a car and a pickup truck and a tractor trailer truck. Okay. So it really gives us some uh, very detailed uh, amount of information uh, that really helps inform uh, particularly the uh, transportation engineer or the planner uh, to be able to um, get at what's most appropriate for transportation improvements around the island. And because it's 24 seven, uh, it's essentially giving us a tr just a treasure trove of data that you can't, that can't be captured with just uh, a strip across the road, mm -hmm. periodically put out, yeah. which doesn't give you a lot of, uh, it gives you counts, but it doesn't give you much more detail. Mm -hmm. So this is really just, uh, it's sort of like putting on the, the glasses yeah. and say, what's really happening here? Oh, wow, look, there's a lot more information here. Uh, that, right now, this is just uh, the first one is going uh, on the primary truck route, uh, Orange Street at Goose Pond. So that's going to pick up uh, the, uh, the crosswalk there for the, uh, the bike path. Mm -hmm. So the inbound, outbound bike path over to uh, Washington Street Extension, and it'll pick up the, um, the truck route coming in, uh, in and out of town. Uh, that's the first of many. The second one, um, once that is up and running, the second one is ex expected to go at uh, the landfill entrance drive. So to pick up Madigan Road and all the traffic coming uh, to and from uh, the landfill, as well as the bike path there. And again, it's just a second point of uh, data that will be able to uh, start to inform a lot of different decisions that uh, happen. Uh, it's a separate type of camera. The camera that is used for the computer system for the tracking is, it's not, uh, if you looked at it, if you saw the screen, it's, it's uh, computer can read it, but it's not as clear as what you would do uh, or what you would see. But uh, the police are uh, putting a uh, point, uh, what do they call it, a point zoom tilt, uh, uh, a PTZ, it's a point, a pan, tilt, and zoom camera. Uh, on the top of that same pole. Uh, so that's more of a security monitoring type thing that uh, is similar to some of the other stuff that they have downtown. So they are taking advantage of that location. Thank you. you. You got it. Rob, do you have any reaction to, um, and we've had some from the police chief, on the um, free bicycle path article? DPW would be involved in the signage and what have you. I'm sort of curious if you, if the DPW slash you, have a reaction to the luxury article, um, citizens article. Yeah, the only thing I'd say about the the bike paths or really any of the roadway systems, we've seen a couple different things happen. You know, and I'll I'll go to Milestone Road as a great example, uh, including Rotary. So there's the state requirements and then there's Nantucket. So I think it's important that as we look at any of the transportation improvements that we recognize what signage is necessary uh, to either meet state or federal law, but then how does that get modified if it needs to be modified uh, to meet what makes sense here for Nantucket. And we look at this for pretty much every project we deal with. Here, you know, I, I really don't have an opinion about the operation of if you're going to give preference or go in, uh, uh, suggest something different than what state law uh, currently uh, dictates with regard to who has the right of way. What I would say is that when we look at either building new or uh, operating and maintaining these facilities, that we have uniformity when it comes to signage, when it comes to striping, uh, and making sure that they get updated regularly. Uh, and the bike paths have really not been. Uh, we're going to get at that. We're, we have a project that took place this fall uh, that shifted our attention from roadway uh, pavement 
inventory and assessment, condition assessment, uh, has now focused on bike paths for the first time. So we've inventoried 35 miles of bike path, uh, including the striping, uh, the signage, and the condition of each path. Uh, that, that data is going to be available this spring and will help us uh, put together a contract uh, to, to get the striping and signage updated. And uh, I'm sure it'll be informed by whatever happens at town meeting. Thank you. I have a similar question. How, how do you, or what are you thinking around the about the uh, Parks and Rec director position? So, <laughs> no, that's quite all right. Here I am. Um, I, I think that um, the current, current status of the parks programs um, uh, is working well uh, from where I sit. You know, we're involved with operation and maintenance, and we coordinate with the folks who are actually running programs uh, at the community school. And, you know, there's, there's a lot that we are catching up on uh, with regard to parks, particular to the synthetic turf field. Uh, so I was happy to report to the town manager that we've, uh, for the first time since the field was installed, we actually had uh, the field tested uh, and ultimately maintained by a professional service from off island. So that was great. And uh, we actually got kudos uh, from the people that pay attention to these things. And they definitely appreciate it uh, because it had not been done. So we're working together with uh, the finance group to procure services, uh, to put something in place to have that service repeated twice a year uh, and to keep it up. Because the bottom line is it's a major investment that is around the corner to replace that synthetic turf surface. <coughs> and uh, maintaining it goes a long way in pushing that out. I think uh, running parks programs out of our department is not what we're set up for currently. Could it be done? Certainly, but it's not something we're currently set up for. But having a person join your department whose eye is on all the maintenance of all the issues, gathering it all together, sort of coordinating the maintenance and, I, I, you know, because this is, I guess my understanding, like, my, my sure. is that, um, you know, I think if it will be a popular concept among the town's people on the town meeting floor, and I think the concern that I have is how does it fit into your existing operation, and is it of benefit to you? So I, I think the operation and maintenance of the fields uh, and anything that's related to parks programming is already being looked at and either assessed or uh, programmed in for future capital. Um, that is, in my opinion, already covered. Uh, it may not be happening as fast as people would like to see it happen. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about is either uh, further development of fields or that sort of thing. But um, you probably are aware that we have a Parks and Rec master plan that was just completed. Uh, the Parks and Rec committee or commission is reviewing that and will ultimately make recommendations uh, to the select board on <coughs> what, what specific pieces of that master plan uh, they would recommend moving forward on. But that was an effort that you know, we recognized three years ago <coughs> and said, hey, instead of just going in and trying to um, uh, replace one uh, playground, let's hit the pause button here and really take a look at what we have for resources island-wide and what the current needs are. Because mm -hmm. the, the current needs have changed substantially since, you know, 1950s when a lot of these fields were constructed. So I think that, that has gone a long way to really help people understand what the current needs are here uh, on island and to make sure that the, uh, the island's needs uh, for current and future uses are really taken into account. So we've learned a lot, and I think we've opened a lot of eyes with the master plan to recognize, you know, why the fields, for instance, um, aren't, uh, let's say, greening up or staying as green as they can, for instance, throughout the, uh, the summer during the growing season. And 
the answer wasn't that, hey, we're, we're not maintaining it properly. The number of hours that they're being used uh, precludes the ability for those fields to recover properly. So again, it's, it's understanding really what's happening uh, to, to really help educate uh, the people that uh, are sometimes quick to say they have a, a solution. It's more about we need more fields or we need to schedule fields differently or the synthetic turf surfaces can handle up to like four times more usage. So maybe it's synthetic turf investment as opposed to uh, just grass turf investment. Yeah, I don't see this report, this more article so much as a, like I don't see it as a deficiency. Like I don't see that you're deficient in what you're doing. I see this more as an opportunity to do something differently or better. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't see it as I do. Like, you haven't done a good job, so we're going to. Uh, no, I totally hear you. This person, it's more, it can do something better or different to exactly the point that it's made, which is scheduling of the field or having there be different communication around what the needs and outcomes are. Correct. I know we work closely with the community school, the programmers, and I have not, I have not heard uh, any major um, critique or uh, otherwise about either having the inability to schedule or no flexibility to. Uh, they do certainly, they, they would like to see some, uh, so they provided comments to inform the master plan. And I think they are also supportive of consolidation efforts that we're looking at or have been recommended, including putting baseball and softball together at Delta, uh, building out the uh, nobody uh for the fourth field uh, and, and some of those other similar type of recommendations, uh, which would ultimately benefit everybody to, to run programs more efficiently and, and not be running from one facility to another um, for, the, for the similar type of activities. And are you the liaison with the community school or somebody on your team? Uh, we have multiple people, myself included. Joanna, we can always have Rob come back when we discuss the article in more detail um, to to kind of get back on the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, of course, Joe. The park that went in, I don't remember, on Old South Road, did Land Bank take for that? And do they contribute to the maintenance of that? That's Land Bank Park. And that's so, Mariah Mitchell. And they, so you don't have anything to do with it? We do not. Okay. I didn't know if they just paid for it and then you got stuck with the maintenance of it or something. It's Mariah Mitchell in, in collaboration with Land Bank. The okay. Science Park, right? Is yep. that what you're talking about? So Peter, you, she's saying lane bank pays for it. Lane bank. We take things like that into account uh, for any of our projects, though. As if, for instance, uh, Lover's Lane, uh, Oka Ramana Hansett uh, project with the bike path included. So we're we're working with uh, the state DCR, who owns the state forest across the street, mm -hmm. to uh, coordinate uh, construction of a bike path through that state forest uh, to improve the trail that's through there uh, and we're we're really trying to make sure that there's a ability to connect the trail uh, appropriately to um, encourage visitation to that new park so things like that we work together yeah. thank you Peter you had a question good morning Rob two questions hopefully easy one do you have a on um, site agronomist or do you hire that outside of that expertise the studies of grass and the <laughs> dirt. Terry is like, what? Yeah. Uh, we outsource um, any kind of, if we're talking about parks specifically, uh, we outsource that kind of work. Good. Uh, Other questions, since you have the majority of the capital requests, I think I counted 27, and that's good for this <laughs> committee to understand, um, one of which is the facilities, the building, softball question how much does your productivity increase with the new facilities to manage both daily ops manage capital projects outsourcing insourcing so how much does your productivity increase because we all know hopefully we all know that the majority of your rolling stock maybe maybe not the majority but a good amount of your rolling stock is kept outdoors so therefore when it comes time to react to a request that piece of equipment may be down, which then 
or tails facilitating that request. So once again, productivity, does it increase with a new facility? I would say productivity would definitely increase. To give you a, a percentage, um, I, I would be guessing. But uh, the point being that uh, particularly in inclement weather uh, and particularly in colder weather, when vehicles uh, need time to warm up or be cleared of snow, for instance, or snow and ice, uh, that is where you see sort of the, the largest ability to uh, pick up time. Uh, storing things inside sometimes are more helpful in the summertime, uh, running around instead of uh, pulling equipment, um, either shovels, rakes, that sort of stuff out every day and putting them away, being able to keep them in uh, the back of an open truck, for instance, and leave it indoors. Um, it, so all that stuff does add up. And I sort of attribute it to no different than uh, what we do sort of with efficiencies of the budgets, finding new and better ways to save money um, and, and make the, the program more efficient. Uh, just a quick note. Uh, Denise, you brought up earlier about um, asphalt. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the asphalt's produced here. Okay. But the products, importantly, to understand, are come, all the pr products that uh, are mixed together to produce the asphalt are imported. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and likewise, there's no crushed stone or anything like that that we use in our uh, in our programs that are produced locally. So all that stuff is imported. And as a for instance, just cost-wise, the realities that we face here. Uh, when I came in from Central Mass, uh, the local asphalt supplier, uh, it cost me $68.50 per ton of asphalt installed in place. It's two forty-five here. My colleagues do not believe me. Um, <laughs> I think but the part streets of it, are paved with gold here, right? Part of that <laughs> is, um, <laughs> is, is it's, pro, it's product costs. It's yeah. barging in yeah. aggregates uh, from our farm. <laughs> so uh, the town had been previously paying uh, $80 or above for different aggregates, gravel, sand. Uh, we don't use sand too much, but uh, gravel, crushed stone, uh, riprap, and the like. And... So what we've uh, worked together to, to put in place as a contract and working with our, uh, for a aggregate supplier in Hyannis, um, and most of the products we're purchasing now, uh, we're able to bring back on our empty waste options, trash trucks, $20 a ton that we were paying 84 before. So Excellent. I mean, it's things like that yeah. that definitely help add up and stretch you know, these budgets uh, to, to get done what we're trying to. Thank you. Welcome. Would you like, oh. That's a lot you uh, the, 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 the position, L-I-U-N-A, S-A-51 construction inspector. Okay. Sounds really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Lyon is the, the uh, laborers union. Um, the construction inspector position ultimately would be someone who would be versatile but would be really focused on a road opening uh, program. Uh, there's numerous, as uh, both David and Mark had mentioned, and if you've been around town for some time, um, our roadways are dying by death by a thousand cuts, right? So you have numerous utilities uh, that are being installed, uh, whether it's, um, it, whatever it is. Every time there's a cut, there's a new joint, it allows water in and it starts to degrade. And that's what causes potholes and, and uh, just premature failure of that surface. So we spend uh, godly amounts of money on asphalt um, and we wanna keep those surfaces um, basically free of utility cuts. Right now, we are really trying to uh, keep our head above water with this massive, uh, well, with the, with the uh, development that's been going on for at least the past five plus years. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of utility updates and upgrades and new uh, services to various structures around the island. Um, each one of those are cutting into the asphalt. So this job would basically go around and police that to make sure it's done properly and, and make sure that we go um, soup to nuts from the beginning, <coughs> from, the, from the permit process right through construction and probably for the next year uh, warranting that work. 
Thank you. Should we move on to solid waste? Sure. Please, Rob. Uh, solid yep. waste. A few highlights here. Um, staffing wise, we're looking to uh, supplement the solid waste recycling coordinator with a couple seasonal full time folks, uh, sort of waste reduction and enforcement officers to um, really augment. Uh, what we've been able to grow that department into. Um, we need some additional professional consulting services uh, to support the multitude of projects that we have under development, uh, including some monies in there to uh, address the unforeseen for PFAS. Uh, where we're still looking to um, determine what are the, the capabilities of our composter. Um, to help inform uh, future uh, policy around uh, that whole program. And what that means is basically what breaks down and how far does it break down in the, the three-day process that it goes through the, the twirling uh, compost. Uh, we just had our third failed attempt uh, this morning, actually. Uh, we're trying to find a vessel that allows that actually will pass through the composter and be recoverable and show us uh, what's actually happening in there. And uh, it, it's it's one failure after another, but we'll, we're going to get it at some point. So uh, PFAS sampling and testing preparation uh, is in there as well. well and excuse me. Okay. I just want to go back. and What kind of vessels are you trying? That sounds sounds interesting. We are... Uh, the first one started with just a uh, laundry bag uh, that was pretty shredded yeah. uh, through. So we <laughs> updated, uh, we found a stainless steel, uh, we, we got sort of like a stainless steel sock uh, that was packed together and uh, blew apart. Uh, we were able to recover it, but it was completely empty and damaged. Uh, the third one was essentially a stainless steel cage. Uh, and that just came through this morning, and we were able to recover uh, the spine of it, but that was it. I think they want to try a man device next, Stephen. Yeah. Really <laughs> and what does success? Well, it's I'm nice sorry, to use a volunteer. Yeah. Uh, I think we're, so, so what, the visa you put into the digester, and yes. it's, it's destroyed. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, any good ideas, please send them my way. Yeah, what, 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 I'd like to sit in on that meeting <laughs> where you decide what to try next. That's pretty cool. Black box. What, kind of, what does it, success look like in this? <laughs> uh, uh, a, a repeatable, recoverable unit that we could send through there. With, with see, what we're doing is uh, we're co coordinating with uh, some off-island uh, product manufacturers. Okay. Uh, that are sending us their samples of corn-based plastics, uh, whether it's utensils or containers, and so they're very interested to see how this stuff performs. Uh, mostly because they can then market to the island uh, that says, hey, this stuff works through your uh, composter. Some of the products you'll see out there today uh, are marketed as backyard compostable or industrial compostable. And uh, I think the challenge here is because we have a three-step compost process, you know, that includes three days through the, the actual composter, uh, 21 days on the f on the floor inside the facility before then coming outside for about a six month finishing. Um, we're we're starting with the compost process to be able to, you know, see what breaks down there first. There's a lot of products that are they're labeled either compostable or biodegradable, and what does that mean? You know, there's a ASTM standard uh, to follow that is like a laboratory test, but Obviously, we're not in the laboratory out uh, in uh, Madiket. And so we're very interested to see you know, how this stuff performs because ultimately it's going to help us understand how to direct folks to uh, place their materials. And if we have to, for instance, if it doesn't break down in our composter in the first three days, maybe instead of, because if it doesn't break down, it then would get collected and landfilled. Okay. So the, the point is that maybe if we understand that, whatever the case may be, then we could take steps to introduce it at step two so that it will break down you know, by the time the finished compost is uh, completed. So there's things like that that, that are going on. Yeah. Um, overall, 
I think uh, the focus really is on becoming more efficient and uh, in each line, uh, recognizing the limitations of our waste services agreement. Uh, looking to the future, uh, we have a, a solid waste work group that meets uh, every other week to talk about uh, future plans, what's, what's currently ongoing, and try to develop data uh, to make informed decisions on what the, uh, the long term is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're hearing mostly from um, town council and our consultants is the next contract is, is likely to be very, very uh, short term. Okay, uh, the, interesting. The market's out there today and what we're seeing uh, both nationally and internationally uh, are changing dramatically. Um, not in Massachusetts, but in other states, you see major cities that are actually pulling away from recycling. It's pretty scary. So uh, here, the nice thing is we're sort of, we've been validated recently uh, working with DEP, who's developed their own 10-year solid waste master plan. And the things that we've been working on for the last uh, couple of years here are really uh, indicative and in line with what the state and what, uh, thankfully, the uh, Selectman's uh, strategic plan is looking for. Uh, trying to be as self-sufficient as possible, trying to clean up our streams uh, to be as cost-effective as possible. So when we present our stuff uh, off-island, uh, that it is, it's clean, it's uh, consistent and uncontaminated as possible, uh, to bring the lowest price possible. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and trying to manage as much as we can here on island. So really, if the focus is on the landfill, keeping the life of the landfill extended as long as we can, which uh, if we back out that, it's really taking a look at uh, the current operations here and making sure the composter uh, can do its thing with as least contamination as possible. Thank you. I noticed um, on the recyclables were in the bar chart that you sent us, which was pretty handy. It was interesting to me that in 2019, November, that actually recyclables was significantly down compared to prior years, which I found interesting considering, I think, with the new recycling or in the new garbage rules, if I can call them that, um, I thought people would be a bit more conscious of them. So, so we, just to uh, correct you, Denise, what this chart is, is actually the compostable waste stream. Oh, I see. Only. I've, I've missed the heading. Okay. So the focus here, okay. this is actually super positive, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, I'm glad you brought it up because it's important. We started this with I'm glad I read it wrong. an idea to characterize the compostable waste, otherwise uh, previously known as the uh, household yep. waste. So when we first sampled the household waste stream uh, back in October of 18, uh, only 61% of that waste stream was actually compostable. So that was pretty dramatic. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of that, that 39%, was either non-recyclable, non-compostable, or actually recyclables. So 14% mm -hmm. of that waste stream back then was actually recyclable, but it was going through the composter and getting landfilled. Mm -hmm. So that was a, you know, that was, it was just validating what we were sort of visually observing. Yep. And we came in and said, let's really take a look at this. So we've repeated that same investigation um, and we will continue to do that uh, off season and during peak season. And so the trends that we're seeing is exactly the behavior change that we were seeking. Good. Uh, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so over the course of approximately a year, uh, we've seen a pretty dramatic jump, 10% uh, mm -hmm. in um, the uptick of compostables in that stream and a, uh, uh, a similar drop in uh, the contamination. Mm -hmm. So the uh, non-recyclable, non-compostable component is down uh, just 2%, but the recyclables have dramatically dropped. Yeah. So that contamination drop is dramatic because all of that was previously getting landfilled. Mm -hmm. And not just that, but the contamination material that is landfilled is coated with compost. So we're throwing away usable compost and we're throwing it in our landfill. 
Mm-hmm. So it's a it's a double whammy, which again it just it, it really puts the focus back on cleaning up that stream uh, to and eliminate contamination. The other stream, the non-compostable, non-biodegradable, has that shown an increase that people are it has. appropriately sorting and you know, putting non non-compostable materials in the right bin? It has increased and. Uh, the, there's been some complex uh, workings behind the scene to keep up with that because initially uh, we worked with our uh, C and D vendors uh, to take that uh, that material we knew was coming, and it's not a traditional construction and demolition debris uh, component. So, uh, thankfully, uh, our partners with Waste Options and with some of the people in the industry, we, we were able to find a vendor. Uh, that was glad to take that uh, specific non-recyclable, uh, non-compostable stream, and uh, we're doing so at, at the same cost that we were uh, for C and D. So that's been huge to be able to adjust. Uh, we we got to a, a sort of a a tipping point there in July uh, during the peak of the season when we were creating uh, a pretty dramatic amount of that non-compostable non. Uh, uh, sorry, non-recyclable, uh, non-compostable. <coughs> and uh, so we needed to ensure that we found a um, consistent vendor to be able that, to handle That material basically goes off. That's, that's yes. not landfill here. That's correct. Any uh, other questions yeah, for Rob, Chris? I'd like to ask a couple of bunch Chris? of questions quickly. Yeah. Please. And the first one may be for Brian. Brian, the, the budgeted transfer from free cash, is that just is that a plug, basically? How did... uh, no, no. <coughs> Yeah, it's what is it, 1.4 million or 1.3 million? Yeah. That's retained earnings because we don't have we don't have levy capacity to support transferring almost nine million, eight million dollars um, from the general fund into there. So we use their retained earnings. It's probably the next um, very quickly. It's probably the next one as we progress through the this contract that we're going to have to discuss how to handle because. Thanks. And Rob, on the, um, do you have a sense of how tipping fees are going uh, year to date this year? Because there was, there was a pretty big increase in the budget uh, for 20, and then there's an increase again this year. And is, do we think that this year is going as we expected? This year it has been going as expected. Our first uh, report of the year to the select board indicated that uh, I think we were slightly above uh, projected revenues. Uh, because of uh, ongoing construction. We've been, I think Brian and I have been taking a conservative approach that we expected to see a taper off of uh, construction, demolition debris, for instance, and uh, in, uh, the MU attributed to that. So um, I, I think we're gonna continue to take that approach, even though things are continuing to stay busy here, um, just to make sure that we you know, try to limit the, the need for that plug. And is there a corresponding um Ex- variable expense that if that were to miss by half a million, then freight would go down by half a million or something? Or, um, um, not sure if I'm following you there. There is a little bit of it. It depends on what the. Uh, I'm just saying if, if, yeah. if the volume went down and yeah. so the revenue was down, would you also have a corresponding decrease in the expense? So, you, from a budget you, you, perspective, would to you don't really have to worry about it. Gotcha. Yeah. We, we would, depending on what uh, line it was mm-hmm. depending on what it was that was going down so there is some offset um, depending on what it is or maybe more than others so if, if one category was the deep line we would have a corresponding decrease in the expenditure mm-hmm. but it may not be a one for one depending but there. there would be if, so rob and i meet every week and talk about these things and look at it so um, you know we talk about where do you find the time I mean, Thursday mornings at 9 o'clock. And then just another last question. On professional services, which I presume is primarily the waste options. Can I hold you there for a second, yep. Chris? I just, I'd like to give just a concrete examples wherever I can. Um, there's a couple really exciting things that have been happening uh, that we've been work, working together on uh, as far as efficiencies and cost controls. Um, most recently, uh, the, the town explored options to take advantage of state bid contracts. So anytime we procure things, we have to follow state procurement laws. Mm -hmm. And if we bid it locally, generally everyone says, great, it's Nantucket, I could charge you more. 
uh, and the realities of the costs involved you know, dictate a lot of that. Uh, but wherever we can, we take advantage of state bid contracts. Uh, it helps speed things up, frankly, and uh, we, we generally get better pricing because it's done on such a volume. Uh, we were looking into, again, one of these light items that are uh, fairly costly and discovered that pricing for our mattress recovery program uh, were substantially higher than what we could obtain at the state level. However, the procurement process uh, and what was available to us through that uh, state process didn't apply because the town is not the vendor. You know, we have a vendor running our process, so it, the contract was not applicable to them. So we had to seek special approval through the state procurement office, which we were able to get, that allowed us to drop the pricing per unit from 30 dollars to nine so it's dramatic and it doesn't turn out to be billion dollars but it's tens of thousands over the course of a year and again all this stuff adds up so in addition to that uh, we were we applied for and were grant we were given a grant uh, through the state for a mattress recovery uh, which is going to cover costs uh, through I believe the end of calendar year 21 for uh, the trucking and for the fees that we've reduced. Uh, so we're all told we're probably saving about $150,000, $160,000 just in that changeover. And once the grant money's run out, we're still down to that you know, state contracted uh, pricing. So it's it's a win-win, it really is. Great. How many mattresses do we recycle? <laughs> well, uh, I, I don't have a count for you off the top of my head, but it's uh, a pretty dramatic amount. Yeah. Between commercial and residential, I'm, I'm pretty flabbergasted, actually. Uh, it's, it's similar to the story of Take It or Leave It. Uh, yeah. You know, Take It or Leave It was, uh, I did not believe the people that told me when I first arrived that we empty that weekly. Weekly. Uh, it, and it comes back and it certainly peaks in the summer. Uh, take It or Leave It's another quick great example of uh, something that we've been working on for some time now and it's it's about to come together with contract uh, to recover that material so uh, before the end of this year and hopefully sooner than later uh, we'll be working with uh, Cape Cod Express uh, to take this material away and with Salvation <coughs> Salvation Army uh, to recover uh, textiles books uh, furniture Cool. and electronics uh, from this entire operation that right now is getting uh, tossed as construction demolition debris every week. So again, we're, we'll be looking to save somewhere in the sixty to $75,000 next year uh, just in the take it or leave it. And it just makes you feel good because you're doing the right yes. thing. How often will they come? Uh, they will pick up as soon as the tractor trailer they provide is full. So it could be weekly, it could be every couple weeks. So at the end of the week, is whatever's left you put in the tractor trailer, and at that point, you just come and you take it. I mean, we're going to grade. It, it needs to be graded a bit. Uh, so some of this, just like we have in the past. Yeah. yeah. But again, it's it's a much better process. So, last question on professional services, which I presume is primarily just the waste options deal. Uh, is there other stuff in professional services that's significant as well? Well, the waste options piece is certainly the largest, yeah. and there's two different breakdowns for professional services. One is sort of them as a vendor, and the, the other is the support staff for us. So it's it's our consultant, uh, George Aronson, uh, CRMX. It's uh, others involved. Uh, it's town council time uh, to uh, basically consult with us on contract issues and that sort of thing. And uh, and also uh, expanding our, it, it gets into the landfill monitoring program. Okay, so there's a number of different things sure. in there. But, uh, and one quick note on that is we expanded that uh, last year, and uh, I think six months into the previous year, the service for landfill monitoring. Uh, one thing I was told when I first showed up was the, the landfill was to blame for the failure of the sewering of Madikett. Right, so I, I paid attention to that, and we. Said, Stephen Visco did a great job. We really he did, uh, did town meeting on we that. We really one. listened, and I said, "Well, I don't want that to. I don't want the landfill miss to be blamed unnecessarily. Let's get some facts." Mm -hmm. And so uh, we we added 
uh, monitoring or sampling and testing for nutrients uh, at, uh, at our well points that are sampled and tested uh, quarterly. And so the good news was that the new report that's out uh, that just came out from SMAST is now, uh, it's now informed with actual Nantucket data from the landfill. Uh, which is which is great. It's certainly something we've been working towards uh, to make sure that people, you know, have facts uh, and, and are basing decisions based on data. So what I'm interested in the professional services most is, is there a component in there that could, in, is it in waste options or elsewhere that could most likely be a negative surprise? And maybe somebody here remembers, I'm looking back at 2018 where that number was 40% more than budgeted. So obviously some, some, some negative surprise happened that year. Well, I mean, it, there is, and that, that's what Rob and I talk about basically every week, or even sometimes a couple times a week, and it really relates to the uh, amount of services that we're utilizing for waste options. There, the, I mean, Rob has a pretty good handle on what he needs for the consulting services piece, mm -hmm. and the time that George uh, Aaron can have to put in to work with us, or, you know, um, but a lot of it is really just the, the, the cost of disposal. That, that really is kind of the unknown we do our best to project based on past history george has how many years about 15 years of data at least yep. that they calculate from so that that's the unknown and i think in 18 um was one of those times when there was a substantial increase in the amount of view that was being delivered and we paid i think it's 104 dollars a ton for that to dispose and we're mm -hmm. only recovering 30 so there, that, that's the biggest unknown that i think rob and i worry about the most this budget is a volume, it's a, volume. a volume surprise, yeah. and we had a big one that year. Yeah. I mean, that looks like, as you look at this whole page, right, yeah. that looks like the biggest risk. It is the biggest yeah. risk, and okay. it's what we look and talk about. And as I, in the budget presentation that we gave this selectman that I'm going to go through with you, we out, we hold back free cash to have a funding source at the annual town meeting if there's a risk that we have to address. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, any other questions? No? Good. Rob, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. much. Thank you for the great team. answers. Okay, folks, we're on a break. Let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll be starting with the general fund. That was short. That was short for you, I agree. I'm going to call him at the appointment. Oh, what exactly does it do? We can't figure out how to. I just said no. Yeah, no, we have such a. We have, such a, we have land and we have houses and we have bills. Yeah. You know, we have part of our capital campaign. We have all of them and we have money. Um, but. Crack is a two Thank you. Can you, you uh, I got your email. Okay. I've been so, busy. How do you know? Thank you. That makes me feel bad because I've been inundated and trying to. We'll take a walk. Okay. Maybe the first part of Feb. Take care. Thank you, Rob. Thanks a lot. We had a huge trend on the new season, right? So even just getting to get that was tough for us. Yeah. Um, partially one of the things we know about the community at least. Um, um, yes, we should. 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 I mean, that problem, so they're not making you take over operations, problem. right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So we have... Better to have a meaningful discussion. So here's the calendar. We've got Tuesdays out because we have the school in the airport. Yeah, so um, Allie will be, I sent you the school this morning. Okay. Presentation. I sent you the in before I came here. Okay. And then we just received the airport today. Okay. And Allie is going to go back to the office. Okay. She will send that to people. She's already sent it. Or she might have sent it already. Yeah. Did it go to George? Problem, Just check because the. I've been making sure to send it because he has an email address. And so it's so oh, he does? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, All right. I don't know if he knows how to get to it. Maybe oh, not because I, I, um, I forwarded it to his private okay. email yesterday. Anyway, yeah, it doesn't matter. I don't think this well, one did, but I'm sure. Okay. And then um, we have Thursday the 23rd as a flex date. Yeah, we're all leaving to go to MMA. So let's forget that one. Will you be around on Tuesday the 23rd? 28th. Yes. 
we'll so really shoot for the 28th. I would. And if I can, I'll let you know early well, enough in the week so that you can. Hold on a second. We've got that would be four nights in a row. Yeah. What? What? I, I wrote down on Wednesday the 29th. We have a joint meeting with FinCom. Oh well, it didn't, what was no, that so with that's Capcom? Thing, no, that's Capcom a joint with the presentation to the select board on their so, I'm right. Right. select board meeting, Any suggestions? You, uh, and it's going to be posted as a FinCom uh, meeting in case we want to go in and deliberate it. So, but it's a select so they're voting. The they, we have a meeting on Tuesday. So just just operationally, I have a problem with that. You know, they're required to make a presentation both to FinCom and to Board of Selectmen. If we're sitting in the audience at a Selectmen meeting, you know, we're not going to be having a meaningful no, discussion. We're not. So I would prefer that they come to a different meeting. Okay, and present to us. Yeah, I mean. But here's the other question that we talked about before. If they prevent, if they if they present to the select board, the select board signs it off. What's the point of us? Well, right, but but you know, to that point, we need either Libby or the select board to let us off the hook and say this isn't for you to do. Right. Right. And and I would much prefer that to be the case. But if that's not going to happen this year, then I'd like them to come and sit at a meeting and give us at least a half an hour. Yes, uh, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if we can get Libby and Brian to talk about that now, quickly. Um, and then this this is just for for you. I think you told me that you're not going to be here on February twentieth. February. Right, February 20th. 20th, right. And I now, I, I thought that I would be, and yes. now I won't be. Okay, so, so we should cancel so we that should meeting. Cancel that. Okay. I don't love canceling. Um, is it so close? Because we're going to, I think the second and third, we're going to, I'm going to say to people, these meetings are endless because we've got to get through all the warning right. articles. So sorry, the four to six, not guaranteed. Yeah. Bring a snack. Right, right. <laughs> Bring yeah. a snack. So, we might be there. And, and, and I, for some reason, we never meet on Mondays. Uh, although some, so I, actually, sometimes we, we do. do. Yeah. yeah. The third so, we do. So, so I don't know if Monday the seventeenth we could do, but I'm leaving the island on the nineteenth, so the twentieth. Yeah, I'm leaving on the twentieth. So, okay. That's okay. Um. So when do we want to do our island home? I think. Um, I would put because look at next week. I mean, next week already. So, so I, I think what Brian just said is the twenty third is no good. The twenty third is no good. Did we say yes? No good because Brian's not here. But the twenty seventh. Well, actually, wait a minute. I've got January twenty seventh. Mm -hmm. Tentative joint meeting with Cap Capcom and Select Board, but that actually should be the Wednesday. That is the Wednesday. Right. So. So what? So we don't have anything that's particular scheduled for twenty seventh. We don't. We could do our island home then, because here we look at this. We've got the twenty seventh, twenty eighth, twenty ninth, and thirtieth. Mm -hmm. So it's four nights. Yeah. It's a lot. It it is a lot, except that I don't think the Wednesday is really our meeting. Well, I, I go to that. I go to the select board now. Yeah. 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 Okay. So it's a lot for me. Let's put it that way. <laughs> it is. It is. It, 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 it is a lot, but it's not one. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's so, one so less for FinCom. It's, if, it's if we could eliminate either the 28th or the 30th, we'd be good. We can't eliminate the 30th. It's the town council review. Yeah, no kidding. Okay. So we're not going to eliminate that. The 28th. I mean, we don't have to eliminate them. It's just I'm conscious of, you know, Yep. Taking four nights of, or potentially three nights in a week of people. Mm -hmm. That's what happens now with this. Yeah. yeah. So. We built our big building. Okay. Joanna. So one twenty-three to one thirty. Okay. Thanks, Joanna. Okay, so that's five. Okay, so let's let's do. I think we still should just do the Monday, the twenty seventh, should be our island home. Because you know what, it wouldn't be a bad discussion to have with select board. Right. Right. So our island home for then. Okay. It was a different work. I'd much rather be home. Brian. Yes, ma'am. The twenty seventh, Monday, the twenty seventh, for our island home. Let's shoot for it. 
Okay. Okay. Yep. Now we it's also have on that day. Monday the twenty seventh for Ireland. Yeah, I'm tentatively yes. Okay. Because it's all on my shoulders now. Right? Mm, I know. So, Libby, could well, you come here for a second, please? So we were just talking about Capcom. We have Monday the 27th, flex date extra meeting placeholder, tentative joint meeting with Cap Board, Select Board, reviewing the capital Capcom. Before At Monday the, the 27th. Meeting, no, this right. is the Monday the 27th. Oh, oh. And then, then it is going to be reviewed on Wednesday the 20th, the 29th. Stop right there. Is that on the Capcom? A lot of people I know. The 27th. Okay, so I think that was a discussion. Yeah, it's a Okay, so so we're gonna do our island home that night. But my observation is if we do not see any of the Capcom stuff before the select board signs it off, there is no point in having FinCom then sit down with Capcom, post that, and say, sorry, you've signed it off, select board, but we now don't agree. Um, you see so my point? The plan is this. Okay. Yeah. The plan is this. They are meeting Tuesday for the final report, approving the, other, the final report on Thursday morning. Okay. And then it will be sent to everybody. That does not, that does not discuss it, right? We, we don't have any deliberations on it. It's just, a, you know, that's, that's a ha ha, I threw it in your email. You're informed. I mean, a review is different than having it show up in an email and, and 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 i think what you know is required is a, is a presentation but you know kind of like the discussion we had in your office a couple of weeks ago yeah if if the process is too complicated and it can't be done in time that there can be a presentation and a discussion with us before it goes to select board anyway then maybe just remove us from the equation altogether and then just go ahead and i mean they're their own thing and they make their recommendation to select board and we're just not a part of it I mean, we, we don't At need to make these cycle. guys do two At things. At least this cycle, right? It may really not be the best way to do it forever, yeah. but this cycle. You do get to weigh in on that, though, because you're making that motion with us. I think what Denise and I are saying items. is that we don't want to make a motion on something that we didn't really participate in in the first place. Like we get it the day before we have to vote on it, or 48 hours before. So what's the point? Partly why you have a member, and so maybe there needs to be more robust report on it. I mean, the the timing that we've asked for in years past is like now eight weeks later. Like so, so there's no time to do a meaningful review of any of this stuff. I mean, I mean Peter, I, I could, mean, I'm sorry. Could you step here for a second? We're discussing Capcom. I don't feel like it. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Look how that went. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, we were just saying we don't see in the cycle that's coming up, in the days that are coming up, there is not sufficient time to for FinCom to review the capital articles you were just saying that. such that I would feel comfortable then saying FinCom says, you know, here's our here's our agreement to what's being presented. And as the select board will be adopting them or whatever they're doing with them, whatever that's called, on the 29th, then there's no point in coming to FinCom after that because the select board just signed it off. Because then we're turning around and saying, well, sorry, select board, and sorry, Capcom, but oops, oops. So I said, I don't know necessarily that I want this to be for every cycle, but for this particular cycle, I think it's sensible to either get them in front of us with plenty of time, or just say this year, the recommendations come strictly from Capcom and select board. And you know, Libby's point is, well, we have you on Capcom, and I'm like, well, that's different than having the whole finance committee look at it. So I'm not trying to not do something we should do, but I also am very uncomfortable personally doing something that is kind of, frankly, a rubber stamp. So emailing it to me, that's rubber stamping it. So. Well, let me ask you a question though. What is the presentation of select board? They're not. They can say that they. I don't know. They endorse the report or anything at that point. They basically. 
would they accept it? change something? Then they don't form or accept it? So, I mean, there would be, you could still have a presentation after their, after and before you make their motion. There'd be yeah. no harm in that, really. I don't know that there would be a harm to having them come in even if it was after the select board because the select board's not formally adopting that, what they're doing. It ultimately rests with you in making the recommendation in the motion. So, what would be the harm in even if they came in after to do a presentation well, to you? If I may cut Just in, because I usually do. Why, why wouldn't we want all of FIMCON members to have the access to the capital request that I have, which is absolutely phenomenal information that can, they can digest that material when they want and have it as, have it as a, an active... The formal report that you adopt next Thursday yeah. is being sent to them at the same time as the select board. Two or day. we're finalizing it, what, Tuesday? No, right? Thursday. 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 Thursday, Tuesday's the preliminary review of the report. Thursday's the final adoption. And then the plan was to send it to Capcom, to select board and FinCon, um, because he's got to get it to Eric about Thursday to, to be able to send in the packet and send it. So, just, I, I don't... I agree with your comment that earlier would be ideal, but is there really a harm in having a meeting in one of the flex states where they come in, he comes in and presents the, the process and what their recommendation was? You know, I mean, part of my concern is the meeting that we all had here and the level of detail that was provided and when it was provided. I mean, any of the follow-up that was promised in that meeting still hasn't surfaced. So I, I don't know that there's either time or there's uh, any interest to share that information, except, you know, when it's all done. So if that's the case, then I, I don't know what the point is. You know, part of, the, in, a, in a perfect world, this all happened before Christmas. We had time to sit down, right. and go that's, through. And that's been made clear over a number of years. It has been made, and it never changes. So I'm at a point where I just say, then why, you know, we're all crazy busy, I get that, and we're all trying to do the right thing. And realistically, I, I just don't see us making any, frankly, real challenges to data that we're getting so late as we're pushing up against all the articles that have to be gone through. I just, I, that's my, no, I, I, I grant you Peter's been through the whole thing. That's great. And we trust and rely on Peter. And the point of having more than three people on FinCom is that you have more eyes on something. So uh, to, to be bold, I would say that you as a chair then should assign more than one of us to that because I've also seen Capcom. Yeah, but that's, well but that's written. You know, it's written what the makeup of that committee is. It's not up to Denise. She can't do that. But I'd also say that I'm not, not only the capital budget has grown over the last whatever years, so has our operations. Right. And we're still trying to fit it into the cookie cutter schedule that we have. Right. I think we have to expand on that. You know, we started meeting as a Capcom in August. Yeah. Which was outside the cookie cutter. Right. Back yeah. in July. Yeah. Can we also have a little more discussion about this? Maybe Tuesday at 2 o'clock? Yeah. Let's yeah. do that. So we couldn't solve it now, so let's try to do it Tuesday I mean, at 2. You send me what you guys want. I, I send anything you want that we work on. No, it's not a question of sending stuff, Brian. That's not no the. Problem. No, 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 no that's, Brian. That, that's not it. It's, okay. it's, it's <laughs> if there is supposed to be review or if, right. if it's intended, if it's going to be represented, there was review by this committee, mm -hmm. then it's got to be Understood. given to us in a reasonable amount of time to dig into what is a massive amount of information and if the answer is that it's too complicated and it takes too long to do so that information can't be provided in enough time then just remove us from the equation and that's also fine but that needs to come either from town administration or from select and I would say that the last point you made Stephen is probably right and and, and, more accurate. and that's, that's, and that's fine and if that's the reality let's just say that's the reality and not pretend like FinCom did this because it, it really you shouldn't we should be reviewing capital before we review operations yeah mm -hmm. yeah I mean you know one of the questions that uh, Joanna asked for was you know what does the current year's request look like in the context of the last 10 years yep. and, and the step answer step was we'll get right that back. to you and then we'll get started and that was weeks ago and it hasn't come so if there's no interest in providing say, information I would say, Stephen, that 
when it gets to the finance department, they are redistributing all of our projects into many piles of monies, and some get pushed back because of that. That's fine, but why not update the 10-year plan? The, the, the 10-year plan that's available on the website is two years old. So we don't know what the request this year looked like as compared to what we expected last year. And that also comes between the chair and the finance department to do that again. Because like, for example, the, what I access... The chair of this committee? The chair of the CAP committee. Right. And Brian, because yeah. it's Brian's department who pulls all of those... Um, we have our own <coughs> site where all of the capital requests are here, and you can go in and see where the funding's coming from. How much is supplemental documents like, like this, for example, is on the power of the board. We have all the data that we need to make decisions, write the module. Right. And why not give this committee access to this? So this is what I'm going to say. You should have access to this. That's my go to. Right. So I don't, you know. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I get it, and that's a neat thing, but you know, to dump that on somebody a few days beforehand and then pretend like we're going to have a discussion. Let's just not pretend. You know, I heard you guys talking before. There's a ton to do. So let's just not, you know, let's save everybody an hour of pretending to do something and actually do something with, the, with something else with that information. Fair enough, but it seems like fairly extraordinary. We haven't actually yeah. State yeah. sat down and gone yeah. through all of these yeah. kind of collectively. Like it's fertilizer and, and, uh, and ropes cross beaches. Yeah, but, and yeah, not, but that's the process. Really that's Capcom. the process that Capcom has right. and I think what dictated we need to, do is to this committee to over a series of years because it's been requested so it's get us information and sooner, and, and, and they've said, can't do it. So if you can't do it, then let's not have the discussion. So, if you're not going to fill out the forms, if you're not going to give us the information until right before, then we're not going to have the discussion. There's also a time where the department is filling out the forms and we're left to try to decide what are we doing with this. I, I, I think works. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not at all laying blame on you or your committee for its process. But this committee has a process too. It's got a certain <coughs> rigor that it needs to put into something, or it can't do it. Or I, I personally don't want to do it. Change of schedule. I know it's, it's always ATM move back. Okay. That was different when our meetings were small and the community was small, but it's just yeah, it was one fire engine. Well set. There they are. We're ready. Come on, Terry. <coughs> no, we can never start without you, Terry. That's why we had the check in meeting. Okay. And that was wasted. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for the opportunity. Brian and I are prepared to take you through, if you want us to, the presentation that we basically gave to the board, somewhat abbreviated, to sort of bring us back to the overall general fund budget, but we don't have to do that. We could focus specifically on. <coughs> town admin items that are in their handout for today, which have been modified a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, what do you prefer? So for me personally, I got to see you live the first time, and I've also read it. So I don't need it, but if anyone here would like them to go through it, then of course we can. What's a show? I think if you just highlight the changes, the, the, the few things that have been updated. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right, so we're not going to go through that whole thing, but I do want to point out that, that was good. On, online there is a PowerPoint presentation, which is what we gave to the board on December 11th. There's also a budget message, which is a much more lengthy narrative mm -hmm. about a variety of different things. It's um, not overly long. It looks like this. Got a mm -hmm. little message, um, subliminal message on the front. <laughs> and it's um, got, uh, you know, Current fiscal year considerations, um, an overview of fiscal 21 expenses and revenues, and some conclusions. And there is a very large amount of appendices to this, which are, I think, <coughs> um, so if you need to go back and refer to things, this is online. And of course, we can answer any questions today that you <coughs> So in your handout today, I'm realizing that in going through it a little as I've been sitting here, there are a few things that we still need to internally sync up. So I might point those out as we go, and they'll be fixed as we, you know, later move, moving forward. 
So we have some of our town admin departments here um, that haven't already presented today, and you know they're available for any questions that you may or may not have. Just quick overview. The departments that are technically in town administration by charter are police, fire, public works, sewer, plus health and human services, finance, IT, HR, natural resources, culture and tourism, and then general town admin. The other departments include the town clerk, the county, the school, the water company, and the airport are all specifically excluded from town administration by charter. And we have sort of out there, not really anything to do with the general fund budget or enterprise fund budgets is NRTA and Lane Bank, just a little bit of an overview. So there are some EIRs in here that didn't already get reviewed by the departments that were here because they're more the bigger departments that have their specific EIRs that they discussed. I think you got a revised Townend <coughs> admin overview. I don't know if it's yellow like it's mine, but okay. I'm mm -hmm. not. I wasn't going to really take you through that whole thing, but we have something of a mission, which includes the bulleted items that are there. We have these were the current goals that that we internally came up with. There's a couple of pages of those, and there, you know, some of them are just what we do anyway as part of town admin mm -hmm. and some are very specific things that support other departmental activities or select board strategic plan initiatives and then we have initiatives and accomplishments just wanted to give you a little update on some of that stuff current key issues there's um, a list of those items um, i won't go through every single one of those but obviously housing is a current key issue we're really working around to operationalize our hazard mitigation plan, coastal erosion mitigation, stormwater <coughs> management and flooding throughout all of our applicable capital projects. So just FYI, that's become a very much of a growing focus. Statewide implementation of the room occupancy tax expansion, the short-term rentals, that, that's, that's a, a key issue because it's going to bring in additional revenue and the select board is having discussion now about how that would potentially be allocated and, and where. Um, Hell Island Home is certainly an issue. Solid waste. Rob was Rob hit maybe the tip of the iceberg on solid waste. There are many many issues with solid waste management, it's not just for us, but it's in a way worse for us in in some respects. But recycling, the need for the public to focus on waste stream separation, the reduction of plastics are all huge issues. There are articles all the time in the Globe and many other places, National Geographic, things like that about. You know, plastics are a very big problem. And as you probably know, we have a, um, pla a ban coming up on June 1st, 2020, that bans some plastics from commercial, commercial only, use, distribution, and sale. Um, a theme, kind of, is the town's ability, gov government's ability to deliver all the services and public demands that we are facing, and with at the same time living within our limited growth projections. Space needs is a big issue. You probably have seen our trailer at the fire station. It's hard to get um, into. I've tried several times. Into. Rita had a good idea, which was that could be the first example of our climate change um, initiative where we're raising everything up. Um, sidebar on that, that we were having some communication with the school as to whether or not they were going to take that trailer. And it took a while, and it was it happened over the holidays. So in any event, they are not taking the trailer. So we are now working to site it with an engineer at that site, and it will become space for meetings. Okay, so that's just be lower though. It will be lower. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now the people have to be really dedicated to go to these meetings. So those, that's just an overview, you know, background oh, yeah. kinds of things. So specifically with respect to EIRs, um, we have, I'll just try to take you through a little bit. For a town admin, we have a data collection initiative, and we haven't specifically assigned something to this, but Potentially, we may be using the Nantica data platform or other group, because this will have to go out to RFP or bid, for something to do with potentially parking 
and or any other need for data collection that presents itself throughout the board's strategic plan. So we will we will be picking a specific project, and it may re be relating to parking. Although Remain has indicated that that might be something they can help with, help us fund. The sustainability office and strategic plan implementation; those are two individual EIRs for one hundred thousand dollars each, and we have not fully defined exactly what those funds are going to go for, but there will be items that the select board comes up with that will need to be funded as part of its strategic plan implementation. And one of them, as you know, is potentially paid parking, but we have this so-called phase one approach that will be evaluated after the first summer, and the board will probably use that to determine whether or not they, they will proceed to paid parking. Right now, the goal is to do that, but they have a um, indicated they'd like to see the data before we uh, launch into that. Sustainability Office, we have had a study done that was funded by Remain as to what a sustainability office structure might look like in the town or what a sustainability function might look like. And we've had a couple of workshops with department heads and others about that. And we don't 100% know exactly what we're going to be doing at this moment. But we are thinking that there may be some, um, we have an idea that we would potentially engage um, Chuck Larson, who was our kind of initial strategic projects manager, and then we <coughs> changed that around a little bit. But perhaps there could be specific projects that we assign to him that he takes on that might further sustainability functions within the town. But we have totally uh, so when you go to MMA, is this some of the things that you discuss? The There's, you know what other towns do yeah. on this? And, and it's all over the board right now. There is no one model for this in in towns. It's all based kind of on where they are, what their issues are. You know, are they coastal? Are they do they have a lot of I don't know ponds or drainage issues or whatever? But um, there's other issues with, mm -hmm. with it. So there, it's all over the board. So, some, we're, we're starting to see more sustainability offices or departments in towns, but it's not, it's not. I wouldn't say it's a standard right, right at the moment, and they're all different as to how they're structured. Thank the, you. Um, the rental <coughs> regulations assistant, a, assistance, actually, this is one of the things we need to sync up a bit. That was put in the boards, before the board, when we were presenting the budget, and that came out of last year's FinCom motion to a citizen article about adopting, about um, adopt, implementing rental regulations. And we weren't sure if there was still an appetite to hire a consultant to review what the impact of that might be or how to prepare or write them. And I, I don't think this is moving forward. Uh, governance workshop. So who's, who's going to pick that up if we're not getting a, a person or a consultant? I mean, who's? Uh, I don't think anybody's going to be picking it up. I okay. don't think it will proceed. It'll drop off. Yeah. I don't know that the Board of Health um, has talked anymore about rental regulations. It's typically something that would be coming out of a Board of Health. Um, and we haven't talked about it, but it's been on the back burner. Like yeah, so I'm, I wouldn't say it's going to go away forever, but I would say that it is going to take some some focus by potentially the Board of Health or other staff or maybe the consulting <coughs> specialists to determine what it would take town resource-wise to implement them, what we might get out of it, and what the impact might be. And also what they are, right? Also you also have to are. define what the rental regulations would be. Right. Well, other towns have implemented <coughs> what they're doing and they have required people who have Airbnb to be inspected by the fire department and to pay a fee for permit to make sure that they have smoke detectors. So they started very small, but it is effective. At least now all the DMVs will have smoke detectors. So they've, they, they've made that like a baseline criteria. Hmm. Interesting. So not to say it's not an issue, but it isn't really in the board's strategic plan. Everybody wants safe housing, of course. 
but it's a big issue. And other towns have implemented it, and they typically would have fees associated with it that may or may not cover the cost of the additional staff and inspections that are going to be required as a result of this. Yeah. So that's the type of thing we haven't really fully explored. The governance workshops and the professional administrative support services, um, actually I think that is meant to be 100000 for both, and we would split that up. The governance workshops are things like after the annual election, we've been lately, like the past couple of years, maybe two or three years, trying to hire somebody or have hired a consultant to come in and review with the board how do they want to govern themselves, what are their sort of ground rules for meetings and board interactions, and what sorts of things um, are, do they need to know for sort of like an onboarding process, that type of thing. And professional administrative support services came out of the staffing study. It wasn't a recommendation, but it was something that we realized, well, I guess maybe I wouldn't say we realized then, we were known, that it, it could benefit administration to have available a consultant who could look at best management practices from other cities and towns about a particular issue that we might be struggling with as to recommending do you need more staff or do you just need to restructure who does what. And sometimes it's hard for us to get at that because of all the data that we are really bogged down with. Um, now the, the other departmental EIRs, I wasn't really going to totally go through. Most of them are one time. There's one for the town clerk for voting tabulators, and it's something that yeah. I, I think we've needed. It, it, it's a, I think it's mandated even by, by the state to, to have these things. Uh, I, IT has two one-time items, PLUS has three, HR has one, and I've just gone over the town admin ones. And those one-time items are going to be covered by free cash. Yes. And I can certainly take you through those if you'd like, if I can locate them in my packet. Um, and departments are here. I guess, I guess maybe I will just Okay. So the two for IT is um, there's $10,000 to upgrade the town e email exchange server, which we have to do every few years. Um, so that's 10000 And <clears throat> as some of you may be aware, we have rolled out Energo, the online permitting. Um, and it's eighty thousand dollars allocated from free cash to complete the next phase, phase three of that project. Um, so that's what the one, two one-time ERs for IT fire department. Um, he talked about his HR. Um, we have allocated fifty thousand for a compensation and classification study, which is something that I think one in particular member on the select board has been an advocate for, um, and we've discussed internally um, doing that. So we've allocated fifty thousand for that. And then PLUS has three. Uh, the first one is for professional services relating to the update of the 2009 master plan, and that is for $100,000. We then have another one, which is to continue the um, ongoing upgrade of their fleet of vehicles for the inspectors to be able to um, go around the island and do the inspections, and that's a $27,000 request that we have, will fund through free cash. And then there's one, for professional services related to the update of the historical architectural surveys from the HDC, um, and PLUS has requested $100,000 for that, and we have allocated free cash um, to fund that one-time EIR as well. Um, and then the town manager went through the remainder, which was um, all in town administration. So those are uh, the remaining uh, one-time EIRs that we will fund through free cash. One of the things we're working towards, and hopefully it'll start maybe next year, is with the replacement of vehicles for most departments, with the exception of, say, public safety and I'm not sure who else, the idea would be that these would start coming forward through public works with central fleet maintenance and mm -hmm. not by individual departments. This one in particular was, it, while it's coming through PLUS, it's been reviewed by central fleet, and <coughs> there is a... Um, developing initiative, I guess I would say, to, there is an inventory of all existing vehicles, what their condition is and when they were purchased and when they need to be replaced, but it just needs to be sort of taken out of the departments and put in the zone. So that, that's what we're going for. And we do all the fleet management ourselves versus, out, versus outsourcing uh, the oversight of fleet management? Um, depending on what the vehicles are, they are uh, DPW Central Fleet now is doing much more of that rather than 
contracting it out, but there are some specialized vehicles that they can't do, like fire trucks. Say. Sure, sure. Um, and they, I mean, they are a bit limited with their facility now. So there's, yes. you know, there there are a number of things that they can do that they haven't done <coughs> before. But but with the size of the facility and the inadequacy of it, they can't do everything. Yep, understood. Thank you. Uh, Brian, on page 21 of the packet 2, it's actually the fire department again instead of finance because I'm pretty sure you don't have um, flammable fluid storage in the finance department, or if you do, I really don't want to ever visit you. So. Well, that'd be a good way to have people not come to my office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to walk through the wall of fire? I think not. So, yeah, no, really anyway, not. just to FYI. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so, see, um, I do read every page. I was a little curious on the back on the town administration with your capital items. Yeah. The stormwater pump three point I mean I thought that was odd that it was not a okay. sewer or a DPW kind of It's items. not sewer, it's stormwater. And it would it is really technically under DPW. So here's the thing though. We've been struggling to try to figure out how to categorize what the capital projects are that are in our hazard mitigation plan. This is one of them because okay. we wanted to call them out specifically so that people can understand we are we are needing to place all of the items in that plan into the capital improvement plan. And there are something like sixty projects. It's everyone all together. Right. We can all right. But but all together. So they're gonna be, oh. you know, scheduled into the CIP yeah. as as we go forward. Yeah. So I think that our our <coughs> current thought is to is to have a category of hazard mitigation in the capital improvement plan, but there uh, it wasn't. The I timing guess. of that was when we got the report, um, we've internally, town manager and I and Capcom have talked, we're gonna create a coastal resiliency category right. and a hazard mitigation category. And those will be moved to those categories, but for purposes of the presentation, it's shown as town manager. Some of the projects that are in the hazard <coughs> mitigation plan, for example, also span different departments there's more than one department that might have something to do with some of them. This is mostly public works, if not entirely public works, but it got into town admin to give it a little focus on the hazard mitigation plan specifically, but it will be managed certainly by public works. And is the underground wiring feasibility study, is that also sort of a hazard, I mean, uh, um, resiliency no. hazard? Man, uh, the underground feasibility study has, this is not the first time that something like this has been um, proposed as a capital item. Several years ago, we had a $1 million underground wiring feasibility study proposed that actually related more to house moves than anything else, but it, and it never went anywhere. This is coming out of um, some recent discussion as to a national grid project that will be, it, it's a feeder project that will be replacing poles at, for a, a feeder, an upgrade to a feeder line called L8. And it, the issue was, could those wires be put underground? And with that particular project, only the feeder is being replaced, none of the other wires. And it, it really, we could probably talk about underground wiring for <laughs> the rest of the day today because it's not just National Grid. There's Comcast, there's right. Verizon. There may be potential other utilities and they all have to be coordinated to be put underground. So this was an ongoing discussion by the board. Some Nantucket Historical Commission people got involved and wouldn't it be great if all the wires could be underground and um, the downtown could be more historic and that whole kind of thing. And perhaps there might be some uh, coastal resiliency measures. Would it be better for some of the wires to be underground in certain areas? Yes and no, because I don't know if you want wires underground right along the shoreline where you're not going to be able to get at them um, in you know, not that long of a time. So this was really a, 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 an initiative that came from the board to look at what would it take to put island-wide wires underground and how would the utilities need to be coordinated already, as Mark Willett pointed out during his discussion, stormwater, sewer, and water are coordinating in advance of a project even being put before the capital program committee, aside from projects that are already in the capital improvement plan. But the idea would be they coordinate their project entirely so that, like you said, everything can be done at one time. So now we're saying to ourselves, maybe we should try to do that with the utilities as well. It gets complicated with them, though, because they need um, you know, their own conduit. And depending on where we're talking about, 
they have pole issues, they have transformer issues, they have wherever their feeders, I don't even know the technical terms for all this, converge. Um, and it's just not that simple to say, oh, when we're doing North Liberty Street, we'll just put the wires underground at the same time. Because the other thing is, we are gonna have to pay for that. They are not going to pay for that because there's no requirement. And by, the town can't require them to do that. Neighbors, maybe, in some cases, would be able to contribute and might be willing to do that, and they have done that in some areas. Subdivisions are required to make sure that their wires go underground, but it isn't, it, we're really talking about existing. So that is what that is all about. It gets complicated. For us, we can say. Um, the other items here are specific to town admin, townwide document management system phase two. This involves getting documents on, um, what's it called? Is it laser fish? Laser fish, yeah. Um, so that they could be you know, easily accessed by not just town departments, but the public. And that, that is a big, ongoing, long, multi-year project. We've also talked, just as an aside, about scanning some of our documents and, and doing it that way. And that gets a little complicated as well, because there's a lot of manual work early on to scan documents. I mean, if anybody's been in my office recently, you see in the corner there's a gigantic pile. It's not that gigantic, but there's a pile of boxes. And we were hoping a senior work off person might be able to come in and start sc scanning some of it. But they have to, there's paper clips and there's sticky notes and there's staples and there's um, front and back. And somebody's got to sort through all that. And then they have to figure out where to put it and name it. So there's just a lot to it. And they have to know how to work again, which is the least of our problems. Um, Townwide security measures. This this is coming out of you know a lot uh, some increase in workplace violence uh, around the country and and some measures we're going to need to start thinking about taking in our public buildings. We have done a lot of training lately, and we're we're still working on training. Um, what's it called active public training? And there may be need to be cameras or special um, I don't even know, locks or panic buttons or whatever that, that we would be seeking advice on how other buildings are you know, sort of retrofitted for those things. Town building, for example, um, it, it's, it's, an, it's an issue in the town building. Uh, We've seen probably an increase over the last couple of years of, I guess, what we might call violent behavior upstairs in the court uh, area. And those people, you know, sometimes they're escorted and often they're not. And we hear lots of noise downstairs about stuff that's going on up there. Never mind what's, you know, they're, they've got an issue as well. But it's things like that we need to really be paying attention to. So those are the capital. Thank you. Um, Libby, we had talked about at the last FinCom meeting about basically risks and opportunities. So from your and Brian's perspective, if you were to take a town-wide view and you, what you see is both uh, if there was more funding, <coughs> what, what would be the top of your wish list or what you think is, could be a real risk for us that could be a budget surprise, you know, not... I can just stop talking. I don't have to explain um, it. <laughs> I guess some of the, I mean, Brian can jump in and even um, staff back here, you guys feel free to tell me something or jump in as well. The, there's some key issues that I submitted in the kind of like supplemental overview that I gave, but um, I guess I'd say not in, not necessarily in a prioritized way, but public works needs more staff to do everything that the public is demanding. And you, we've been talking about the park and rec situation. And the, the thing about that is even if we had a director of park and rec, that person is not doing the maintenance. No, right. right. They, they need staff to do the maintenance. And as Rob said, they, that's the, the sort of coordination of that isn't what's needed. It's the staff that's needed and the equipment maybe to, to do those things. The recreational aspect of it is really in large part, whether intentional or not, being handled by the community school. They are managing the scheduling of all of the playing fields. If the public wants more fields, we're gonna need more staff to take care of them. I said this when we were seeking funding for the turf field 10 or more years ago. We need more staff and we never got it. And then there was an economic downturn. So we have to focus on things like that. And 
it just doesn't ever really reach to to the top of a priority list. Um, PFAS is going to be a real issue. Coastal resiliency is something that's a real issue, and we we're going to need expertise to help focus on grant opportunities. And it, it's great to get a grant, but then you have to manage the grant, and there are a lot of reports that go along with the grant. There's a lot of strings attached sometimes. Someone has to manage and monitor that. I think there are there are more grant opportunities now. They've sort of come back. There was a time when there were no grants or very little, but but now that they're kind of back, somebody needs to chase those down. Do we need a central grant writer? I, I hear people say that, but they're so special they're so specialized by area that a central grant writer isn't really. They can maybe track down what's available, but they're not necessarily going to be a writer of everything. So that's. Another reason why we were hoping for the EIR for some for the for the position like the, the Chuck role I'll just call it um, that can chase down some of the coastal erosion and climate change kinds of things. Um, not necessarily this is a risk or opportunity, but our energy office probably could use a boost in resources as well. Lauren is really incredible at getting around to the public and getting opportunities out and also chasing down grants but she is one person and we are there is going to be a growing focus on the the energy sustainability is aspect of sustainability the energy aspect of sustainability um solid waste is a real issue and we're gearing up well we already have geared up but we're starting to really um double up, I guess, on meetings as to developing options going forward after 2025, and even going forward now to start addressing waste separation issues and plastics reduction and things like that. Um, I don't, you know, housing is um, definitely an issue, and I guess maybe the risk there is having it sufficiently available for the higher level employees that we need in certain areas. We're going to be having some retirements probably in the next five to ten years of higher level department heads. And as the chiefs were both saying, we can probably work out or help work out housing when they get here, but that's not permanent. Rob McNeil is not in permanent housing. And luckily, the water company had a house available from the departure of former director of water company. But um, you know that I don't know if that's going to really go on forever. And the, and that's not the only example where we have some plans or <coughs> avenues that we're working on chasing down now that we have created a formalized housing office. Mm -hmm. And we have a housing, we have an internal housing group meeting like once a month or so, and we're talking about potential, I mean, this is not developed at all, so don't, it's not written in stone, so don't fall in love with it, but we're <laughs> working on seasonal housing somewhere on this site where <coughs> maybe lifeguards could go, well, specifically lifeguards and potentially other seasonal employees that could then potentially free up the land where those lifeguard houses are now for repurposing or removal or redevelopment into perhaps actual year-round housing for these types of departments that I'm talking about, that maybe there are some lots on Tacoma that have been set aside potentially for that purpose as well. But all of that needs to be developed and site plans, you know, there's a lot that, that goes along with that. But that's an opportunity that now that we have a housing office formalized is progressing. It might be kind of slow, but it is progressing. Um, space needs is a definite issue. We, it, uh, you all know how hard it is to find meeting space. Sometimes we have to remove, um, well, that might not be the right word, uh, redirect other groups that are using this room so that you can meet here, mm -hmm. and select board even, and that is just a growing problem. We, we do have a lot of committees in mm -hmm. this town, and they all like to meet and they have to meet in certain places, and they all want to be televised, and that is limited as well. So all of that has to be, we, we could have a meeting coordinator full time dealing with all of this, but we don't. We have somebody in my office and in other offices that do all that arranging, but there's a lot to it. Uh, those are the things that come to my mind. 
<laughs> no, it's exciting. Yeah. Ryan, do you think you want I, I mean, I think some of the issues that I worry about are that the risks are um, some of the things that we have some limited control over. Health insurance is a risk that the town manager and I talk about all the time. We're self-insured, and right now we're still tracking at a good um, we plan to take in the budget. It's an eight and a half percent increase on the, the current rate, um, or eight three quarters, excuse me. And we're still trying that way, but three months ago when we started this process, we were at almost eleven. So it's something that does it wouldn't take many changes to potentially put us in the other direction, and it's it's a cost that is is growing. Um, another thing that really kind of does um, way on me as we move through these budget processes, our general insurance is something that we um, really have limited control over given our location. In the last couple of years, we've accessed insurance to help us cover some things. And mm -hmm. you know, when you hear or you see the catastrophic storms that have hit, say, the Bahamas or whatever, you get the information from the insurance carriers that says, you know, we're sustained catastrophic losses. You're looking at 15, 20, 30% increases across the board so that we can keep our reserve levels. Um, it takes a lot of work to get them get it back down to a reasonable level for us. So these things really kind of are the risks that I look at. And then we look at on the revenue side, you know, um, on local estimated receipts itself, we collect, you know, 11, 12, 13 million dollars, but we collect that from pretty much 50% of that is collected from three revenue sources being excise tax, rooms tax, and meals tax, and, and building permits or four, four or five of them they generate the lion's share of, of that amount of money that we take in. And so that is certainly something that is a risk for us. Um, so it's something that we talk about internally quite frequently about what happens if, if these, these change. Um, you know, opportunities, I mean, I think that <clears throat> we, we look for opportunities to consolidate or, or reallocate resources, but we have a lot of demands and people want a lot of services and it costs money to, to provide those services. So. Um, that's kind of a risk and an opportunity that we, we have to manage. So, sort of a question I think I've asked a couple of times. So we, we've had a trend where, you know, revenues, $106 million operation, uh, you know, revenues have been nicely <coughs> limited by prop two and a half in a certain, certain sense. So it's just going, you know, the gap between projected revenue and projected expenses is actually shrank in the, re in the revision to $153,000. And last year when we started, it was 2000 if you remember. Well, so. No, and, and, and so and so what happens when we have a year where, I don't know, expenses grow 3% and revenues go down 1%? So then mean, we have to make adjustments. So you've got to go around and make adjustments. We've got to make adjustments or we've got to find consolidations or we have to wait, find ways to deliver the services in an alternate method or I have to find ways to generate more revenue. Yeah. So, which we fortunate, we've been fortunate. We've, that we've been very with. fortunate. On a capital program, mm -hmm. you know, the town's AAA rated, which congratulations. Yeah, uh, excellent. Well um, but we've seen in a lot of the departmental and enterprise funds that, you know, there are huge capital expectations over the next few years. <coughs> How close are we to losing that? Or, I mean, um, or, or maybe in a more positive sense, do we have the borrowing capacity to remain AAA? And, yeah. And um, borrow money for all these various projects and the various uh, elements of the town's budget. So I'll answer the first question. How close are we to losing it? Um, I think that I said when it was announced that we got it that it wasn't easy, but the easy part was getting it. The hard part was maintaining it. Okay. But every time we do a borrow, we have conversations with Moody's. Moody's is fully cognizant of the large amount of capital projects that we have outstanding, um, not only in the general fund, but in the um, in enterprise funds. We have very thoughtful, thorough discussions with them on the plan and how we see it fitting in and what we see happening. Um, so I think that to answer your question, I don't think we're at risk of losing it because we've been able to do a good job conveying how we're managing this. And if you look at the general fund, a lot of the larger scale projects, we ask the taxpayers and they've been very supportive of the voters of using debt exclusions so there's a dedicated funding source. So Moody's takes that into account when they look at how we're doing this. And we, again, this year we're, con we're proposing contributing $5.9 million of free cash. So we're using reserves annually and we're able to rebuild those reserves annually to continue to fund a substantial amount of capital. They're very happy that we continue and we've been able to continue to recommend putting $500,000 into OPEP every year. 
and you know that's a lot more than many communities, with the exception of maybe Wellwood, who's fully funded, um, have done. So when they look at the overall big picture of how we're doing it, they're very happy with the way that we're going about it and managing it. And I think that um, even they recognize that we may face a a slowdown. I don't think a slowdown would be as catastrophic as the last economic downturn. I think there's this massive bubble underlying it. But they understand, and we've talked about how we would plan and what we would do. So we, we're very we're very upfront with them on what our plans are, what our outstanding dollar issues are, and how we plan to, to manage it. Um, and they've been, to this point, they've been very satisfied and happy, and they, you know, they have mentioned that we're, we are taking, we've told them we're taking a very long look at hazard mitigation and coastal resiliency, because it's very critical and important to us, and that's something that's on their radar. So we have those conversations. So. I don't think we're at a great risk of losing AAA, to be honest with you. Um, I can't guarantee that something wouldn't happen, but I would, and certainly my staff, and working with town administration, we do everything we can to not, I don't want that to happen. No, certainly I, not on my watch, okay? okay. Um, but I, I don't think we're at a great risk for that. Thank you. And I, I, as I, I think we all think we do a great job. Thank you. Administration. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, go ahead, Peter, please. Ryan, on your financial barometer, do you have any yellow lights or are they all green? <coughs> no, I don't think they're all green. There's a couple, um, I think building permits have, have seen kind of a, a change. I think that I've talked to Andrew, and there was a big rush last year with some of the proposed zoning changes, and whenever those happen, you mm -hmm. might see a little uptick because people want to get their permit in before yeah. the hearings are published so that they, they fall under those prior rules. Um, and we've seen a little bit of a leveling off, and. Some of it can be timing differences, but um, it's certainly something we're looking at. Um, we look at even freight traffic and ferry traffic we're looking at and get to see what's happening with that. Um, there's a couple, like I said, building permits. Um, there was a yellow light, I think, relative to motor vehicle excise, but it's timing with commitments and when they come and when we collect the money. And we always end up collecting the motor vehicle excise tax anyway. Um, the two that think I look at the most being rooms and meals are both green and are still have been very positive all along but there are certainly ones that we look at and, and try to understand what's happening so um, we take the dashboard very serious we're actually in the process of updating it with um, the help of a grant from remain that they funded for with community data platform to actually make it online in real time so it could be updated um, not daily, but pretty much weekly, with a transfer of flow of data from not only Munis, but from the data sources that they've called to help us do that. So um, I don't think there's a lot of yellow on it, and there's certainly, I don't believe, a lot of red, if I recall, but it's it's Great. still something we look at, and it's a useful tool that Ali and I talk about all the time, and we try to talk about with town administration, too. Thank you. On the Health and Human Services Department, on the salary line, who 2019 was about five, you know, it's gone from five and a half hundred thousand up to 850 proposed budget. So over the, from 2019 budget was 539 and change. Actuals was 563 and change. The 2020 budget was 748. And then the budget for this year is um, 851. So I just wanted to know what the hiring was under HHS Libby. Uh, is that the human services director? Yeah. And the, um, we added an inspector <clears throat> okay. last year, and the human services director is, it might not have been totally under health and human services. Oh, is that yeah. what it was? Rachel. So Rachel was only partly was Rachel, under. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. See? Other questions? My big question coming in today for Brian was about, you know, what is the risk of the slowdown or the lack of new growth um, long term? So I, I think you touched on that with uh, with Peter's question, but if you have any more to add, I'd love as much detail as you can provide. What do we do um, when, not if, new growth slows? Well, I think that we <coughs> we're very fortunate that we've consistently generated even more new growth than we've projected. Um, we have a really great team in the assessor's office that's out all the time, and we utilize a lot of consultants to help us through that. Um, I think that 
that risk would be mitigated as I think the town manager and I have mentioned before, we would look at what the trend looks like and most likely the starting point. I don't want to necessarily speak to the town manager, but probably my recommendation to the town manager if we experience some type of slowdown um, that hopefully we were able to see coming a little bit um, would be probably I would recommend that we would start by slowing the open position hiring town mm -hmm. to, to see how we can manage through and um, and take and go from that. I mean, I don't want to, if it's just a slowdown and we think it's manageable, I don't want to rush into catastrophic decision or, or rash decisions. So I think that would be the start is maybe looking at um, a recommendation to the town manager that we consider a hiring freeze or chill and leave open positions open for a little bit of time to, to gather, to be able to continue to um, understand what it looks like. I think there could be a recommendation that we slow some of the, um, I'll call it non-essential spending within the operating lines um, as a way to manage it. And obviously if we thought it was gonna be prolonged then it'd probably be a deeper discussion on is there changes in staffing levels or changing in operational expenses that we have to do? I mean, some of it too really depends on what, in those types of scenarios, if we're experiencing it, then probably the entire Commonwealth as a whole is experiencing it to some extent. And it would really depend on, you know, during the last downturn, we faced nine C cups from the state because of the, what they weren't able to do. The other thing is we have to remember is that we have... What are those nine C cuts? Nine C is the statutory authority that the legislature votes to grant to the governor to cut state or local aid or reduce it in extreme cases. And it's happened in, um, in times when I, when I was in Melbourne before I came here, which was the same time that the town experienced that they did, there was a reduction in, in state aid um, for the Got state to try to do it. But um, I think one of the other things that we have I'll call it the rainy day fund. We have a very, we have a substantial amount of money in stabilization that the policy in a slowdown would allow us to, to expend or withdraw from, but it also requires that once we do that, before we can go back and try to take additional funds from it, we have to put it back. So um, there are options for us in how we would manage it. And I mean, we have had discussions on what it would look like, just so that we're prepared if it happens, what it would look like. And I think as I mentioned, my start would probably be looking at what operational expenses could be delayed and what hiring could be delayed as a way to see what the impact is before we make any further, what I would call drastic decisions in, in changing staffing or other things. Can you um, elaborate a little more on the stabilization funds, just the status of those? It's, uh, it's about $5.5 million in it. We're recommending um, adding, I think, 500, an additional 500,000 for free cash this year to, to continue to in accordance with the policy, the financial policies. We have a section in the budget message about all of this, mm -hmm. and just I'll just you'll read it later. But in 2009, <coughs> we had an ad hoc fiscal committee, and they came up with a variety of revenue possibilities. Those are I, I usually list those in the budget message so that we don't lose track of them. Most of them never really got off the ground because nobody wants to do them, but some of them did and have continued, and we specifically list measures we might need to put in place in the event of an economic downturn. Those include pretty much everything Brian said, potential austerity budget, a reduction in force, a hiring freeze or chill, like maybe a travel freeze or chill, probably a little chill, um, eliminate unexpended expense increases, reduce NRTA year-round service, that would have a delayed impact because of the way the NRTA is funded, but things that are not you know, municipal operations, um, defer capital projects, maybe potential use of the stabilization fund, that would be a really a lot of yeah. yeah. I mean, and to the pie chart that you sent us in the PowerPoint presentation, state funds for us are 4% so far. <coughs> yeah, so if there was any change in that, I mean, in the largest part of the 4%, we're at least chapter 7. Unrestricted, generally, we get seventy-three or seventy-five thousand dollars a year. We get very little. So, <laughs> yes. yes. Other questions? Really none. Okay. We can fabricate some. <laughs> great, great work by you guys in terms of the whole thing today. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. So yes. I, I actually, thank I wanted. Ali. I do want to recognize and thank Allie because she has done the yeoman's work to prepare this with the department. 
and go through it and not only prepare it, but put it together to be able to send to you. So I do want to say thank you to her for all of her hard work on this. Thank you, Allie. Thank you. Thanks. But I mean, seriously, I went line by line on every document you sent. And I have to say, even in the three years that I've been on FinCom, I just think this, this review process gets better and better. I, because you just, I had questions, but they weren't, you know, ha, 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 ha. so, and having done about a bazillion, as I like to over exaggerate, um, budget reviews in my life, this has just been a very productive one. It's clear, the information is clear. You know, I, of course, you can always deep dive into line items, but that's really not our intent. And the fact that you manage it on the exception basis and you highlight those to us. And I think everything about this has been a very productive, from my perspective, really a very productive working collaboration. And we, I appreciate it very much. And I know all the hard work that goes into it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Now, we had on our agenda review of the appropriations. We can talk. Those are just, um, so included in the packet, I have to pull it up if you give me one second, was um, essentially the um, the revolving funds. Yep. So these are just some of the articles that will come there. We recommend the seasonal food service. We're recommended in discussion with the, uh, the health director. That, that's the same amount. Um, it's funding for some permanent salary and some seasonal. Same with septic system um, that funds a portion of, I believe it's the health director and one of the other inspectors in the office. Park and rec revolving essentially is, there's a small amount for the use of the property. The majority of park and rec has been the fair revenue, which reflected, um, we're estimating about 19,000. We've collected historically a little bit more than that, but we like to be conservative. And then we estimate about uh, 16 or 17,000, about $16,000 in expenses. And we do pay for some um, repair and maintenance um, from the, the fund for uh, the fields. Ambulance reserve is one of the largest. There is a, um, there's gonna be a small change to this. Um, it was brought up during the chief's presentation. The $57,000 that is in the salary permanent actually will be going back in and it will actually be reducing in the general fund because we charge six employees, the, the six lowest paid firefighters, get charged to the ambulance reserve fund, but they some of them are also in the paramedic class. So okay. we'll be moving that educational incentive from the general fund to here. Okay. Um, as we rework and given the transitions and some of the, the changes in staffing, it, it, it's kind of a moving target as we go through this, but that'll all, that's gonna be something we're working with them on. Um, where right now you'll see we are keeping the same 600,000 as we have budgeted this year. We, we're in constant communication with Comstar, who does all of our ambulance billings. We're not able yet to take advantage of the ALS rates that the select board set because we don't actually have implementation, a full implementation of, the, of that yet. When we do have a full implementation, Comstar has looked at it and the additional revenue based on the calls that could have qualified for ALS will probably generate about another $150,000 approximately in revenue into that fund. Um, and then bringing it to just about break even. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there is fund balance in there too. For, I think it's seven or eight hundred thousand. So they're, okay. they're, they are um, actually already ahead. A little ahead. Yes. Which we use a lot of the fund balance to fund the equipment purchases and or in, in, on an annual basis, like in every other year, the ambulance is that for upgrade because they're very expensive. Uh, waterways improvement is in here as well. Um, we're recommending the same levels of funding again in consultation with the departments. Lifeguard and Low Beach Housing are the two um, revolvers associated with the police department relative to um, seasonal staff, and that's just merely the rent that's collected, and then we allocate uh, uh, resources to be able to um, maintain the buildings. Ferry embarkation fee. Um, that's money collected on the sale of the ticket books, which goes to the CSOs and whatever. We authorized 195,000, and once we get to that level, uh, the rest goes transferred into the, the operating budget in the police department. And then beach improvement is split between not only natural resources, but um, police department, they share in that, and there's a breakout, the 27250, I think, is natural resources, and the 27251 is the police department, and they share in the the, the revenues um, from the sale of beach stickers there and, and 
for services allowed under the statute that that was authorized under. And then we have shellfish propagation, which funds um, staff in the natural resources department for a propagation facility. Um, I don't know that it was actually included on here, but there was, we will be talking about it again. Um, another revolver that we'll talk with the airport is the fuel revolver. Mm -hmm. That will be recommended at the same $5.2 million level. Okay. And um, for anybody who's not familiar with what we do, we have the fuel revolver to manage the, the, per the sale and purchase of fuel. The airport, once we hit the statutory cap of $5.2 million, all excess sales go into, into the airport general fund, into their operating revenue. And they're allowed to use it for not only the sale, of, for the purchase of fuel, but for repairs to the fuel plant as well. Mm -hmm. Good. Any questions? Nope. No. Okay. Thank you very much. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make the boat. <laughs> You're going to make the boat. Please come back, though. You're not allowed to leave forever. I'll be back Monday. Don't worry. <laughs> So we'll, we'll see you Tuesday, Libby, we'll see you Tuesday at 2. <coughs> and then um, we'll see you Tuesday night. Ali, again, thank you very much. And all the departments, thank you for being here. I know we appreciate yes, thank it. Thank you for the pastries. You're welcome. The and a very wait, boost at eight in the morning. wait, wait, we have doggy bags. <laughs> so please, please take some home for the people you got to miss this morning.